in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the one God to whom we forever give thanks and praise for raising up in our midst the black man and black woman of America, a divine leader, a divine teacher, a divine guide, his Messiah, in the person of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But if I live to be a thousand, or just the right old age of Methuselah, I will forever and eternally be grateful to Almighty God, Allah, for giving to the black man and black woman of America through his Messiah, one that is a leader, teacher, and guide by their permission for the liberation and salvation of the black nation, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet you, my beloved and beautiful black brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace, assalamu alaikum. Hotel, Alafia, Freedom Land, and Black Laws for all black people. I am honored to have this time to spend with you here at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn to speak to you on such a timely subject. To speak to you tonight on Jungle Fever. Now let me say first off that before the evening is over, we hope to have a question and answer for you. We want to focus on the problems that black people are facing today. Faced on every hand by the attack of our enemy and our oppressor who is coming at us through aid that he has manufactured. Coming to us and coming through other mediums where he has put drugs everywhere and alcohol everywhere. Where he has so messed us up until we have in the communities where we live in the black nation, we are suffering from genocide. We are suffering from genocide. We are suffering from fratricide. We are suffering from not being on the right side and always being on his side where we should be doing something positive for and in our best interest. Brother Spike Lee, a very brilliant brother, one of the great minds of our time, who is a probing mind who forces us into a posture and position where we must begin to grow and where we must begin to dig and search and research and open up dialogue. The array of the task that he was able to garner, pull together some of the best that we could find anywhere on the big screen. Brother Wesley Knight, one of the greats of his time. Sister Billy Siobhan Stickney and others, great of this time. We want to look at Jungle Fever from a balanced view and a balanced perspective because it has positive as well as some dangerous negatives. In fact, I believe that the positives in Jungle Fever outnumber the negatives, but I believe that the negatives outweigh the positives. But we will look at it before the night is over. We are taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan that of all our studies, history is best qualified and most attractive to reward our research. That if we know what happened yesterday, we can intelligently discuss today because today is built on yesterday and tomorrow is built on today. And if we know what happened or went down yesterday, we're not likely to go for, to fall for the same thing and let the same thing go down today. Jungle fever. The black man and the black woman, we are taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan that we are the original man and the original woman of the planet Earth. We never made color any badge to wear we never made color an issue. It was the white man who made color an issue. We never used our color against him. It was he who decided to use color, a 
himself. Look at what he does. Angel food, take it, what color? Right. It's all right. What color is it? Right. Ain't no white folks in here. You don't have to be scared. What color is angel food, cake? Right. What color is devil food, cake? Right. They say you wear white to weddings, and what color do you wear to funerals? Right. If someone is wicked or evil, and they know something on you, and they want to get money out of you, then what kind of male are you? Right. If you're in a fraternity or a sorority, like one of the fat that the sororities out at Jones Beach at the Greek Fest, just a shot time ago, and you do something that causes you to get put out of the fraternity or the sorority, they call it what kind of ball are you? Black ball. They say Ajax goes through the community cleaning like what kind of tornado? A white tornado. When the westerns or the cowboy movies come on, you can tell the good guy because he always wears what kind of hat? Rides what kind of horse? It's not good to lie. But the white man says, if you must lie, buddy, it's all right. If you just tell a little what kind of lie, a little white lie. If you are unique in your family, or in some cases called the odd one in your family, they say you're what kind of sheep of the family? What kind of sheep? The black sheep of the family. Even if you get ready to go and play pool, or a game of billiards and you get your fancy stick and you go into the pool room, there's a white shiny ball on the table and that shiny white ball knocks the hell out of the black ball, the brown ball, the red ball, the orange ball, and all of the balls of color on the table. And the worst ball on the table is what color? And that's what number on that ball? We can't even go into the pool room without the white man exalting a white ball over the rest of the balls of color and saying, stay away from that eighth ball. Stay away from the nigger ball. Stay away from the black ball. He makes color a weapon to use against us on a consistent basis. Let's go further as we look at it. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Brothers and sisters, there was a time when the white man would kill you, would actually kill us, for looking at the white woman. Did you know that? He had laws on the book, some written, some unwritten. He had one law that he called reckless eyeballing. What did he call it? Reckless eyeballing was if he caught you looking at a white woman, that was a crime. He had another one he called disorderly thinking. If he thought you were thinking about a white woman, that was a crime. If he caught you looking at a white woman's clothes hanging on a clothesline, he was subject to kill you, black man, lynch you on the spot just for looking at the white woman's clothes hanging on the clothesline. If a white woman was walking on the sidewalk and a black man was coming down the sidewalk, the black man had to jump out in the street off of the sidewalk and let the white woman pass on the sidewalk, reckless eyeballing, disorderly thinking, looking at a white woman unbecoming to a white woman. He said she was pure and holy and divine. She was the flower of the South and the flower of the white nation. And he did everything to put her on a pedestal and to protect her and to secure her. You remember the history of Emmett Till, Max Parker, and the so-called Scottsboro boy where the white man always, then, after then, and before then, always, whenever he took a black man into his hands and decided that he was going to kill that black man or lynch that black man, he would always cut the black man's male organ off, cut the regenerative organ off. In some cases, he would even put it in a pickle jar and put an inscription on the jar and said, this is what happens to a nigger that looks at a white woman. Now, if the white man would do all of this over the white woman, in South Africa, he worked hard to keep his white woman away from the black man. But as soon as he decided that he was going to fool the world about apartheid, what is the first thing he did? 
he relaxed the law between his woman and the black man of South Africa. Where the white man used to kill us, black man, black brother, where the white man used to kill us for looking at his woman, now he's given you his dog. That's what I said. He's given his dog to you. You walking around Brooklyn with jungle feet. Walking around, walking your dog through the down flat bush. Walking your dog in the bush. Walking your dog on Fulton. Walking your dog on 125th Street. Walking your dog on Malcolm X Street. Walking your dog on Frederick Douglass. Walking your dog all over and throughout the areas and communities where black people live. Even at the African festival, we had some handkerchief head Negroes walking around, walking their two-legged dogs here at Boys and Girls High at the African festival. A wonderful festival, a great atmosphere representing the rising tide of black blackness, black pride, and the rising tide of culture and consciousness among black people. Can you imagine a black man walking up and some of the fools even had on kente cloth? A silly fool with a kente cloth crown on his silly crazy nappy or his scary curl head walking a white blonde haired dog, two-legged dog, up and down and all around throughout the African festival. So you got jungle fever. He's gone white girl crazy. She's gone black boy hazy. Walking them up and down and around. You got Susie Rotten Wickle, Kathy, Candy, Heather, Cindy Lou, and Angie or Angela too. How can you walk the white woman around? at a festival that is dedicated to rescuing and reconstructing your history that has been taken by her people from you and you have been robbed of a knowledge of yourself by the very people that you are parading around with. Why, our great, great grandparents would turn over in their grave if they knew that you had a leash on your dog, a kente leash or a mud cloth leash on the neck of your dog walking your white two-legged dog around parading her in the face of the black woman. And some of the sisters were with Bob and Bill. Some of you were with Larry. Larry had on a booba. Larry had on the red, the black, and the green. And he passed every now and then with his hairy, disease, AIDS, herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea self. He passed by with his nasty, stinking, mangy self, throwing up his little puny arm in the air as though somebody was going to go for the height. How are you, brother? Pete, brother. Yes. Not P-E-A-C-E, -E, but P-I-E-C-E -E of your white behind. That's the peace that we want from you. But some of you don't find anything wrong with that. You say, you're just so silly. Well, it's love. Love transcends all borders and boundaries. You can't tell people who to love. Anytime you make a decision, you must ask yourself, black man and woman, who's profit? Who's lost? How will this affect my people? Not just me as an individual. How will this affect the masses of black people? Oh, Brother Spike Lee, our brilliant brother, and we love Brother Spike. Before you put jungle fever on the screen, you must ask the question, how will this affect the masses of black people? How will they relate to this? Those who were responsible for New Jack City, you must ask the question, how will they, out in the streets among the masses, how will they relate to Nino Brown? Will they relate to Nino Brown the way the young brothers and sisters related to Superfly? Ron O'Neill playing Superfly years ago and leave the movie theater not 
hating Superfly, not hating Nino Brown, but leaving the movie theater trying to be a nigger and a con man and a dealer of death to black people like Nino Brown. Watch out what you put on the screen. What effect will it have on the masses of our people? You must ask yourselves this. It cannot be for selfish gain. It cannot be for praise and honor among white people. It cannot be just to strengthen your bank account and add some more zeros to your bank account. You must be responsible when you reach the, mat the minds of the masses of our people because the battle and the final and ultimate objective will be for the minds and hearts of our people. We are battling for the minds and hearts of our people, not just to make a dollar. If you will do anything to make a dollar, then you are nothing but a prostitute. You can be a movie producing, I mean, producing prostitute. You can be a movie directing prostitute. You can be an actor prostitute. You can be an actress prostitute. You can be all kinds of prostitutes, as long as your motive is only for money and you're willing to bend over and open wide and give evil an opening. When you have that kind of motive in mind, you are a dishonor to your people. Whatever you do, you must ask, whose profit, whose loss, how will this affect the masses of my people when I look at it mathematically beyond my individual self? What is my responsibility to the masses of my people? Stevie Wonder, a wonderful brother who has given us much of the God-given gifts and talents that Almighty God has blessed him with. But oh, brother Stevie Wonder, I wonder what is on your mind. What happened to songs in the key of life? What happened, Brother Stevie, that you don't have in a vision anymore, that you have now become a blind man on the outside and a blind man on the inside? You're watching the movie, but you must understand. You with me? When I say, are you with me, that's like the preacher. You know the preacher. Reverend Toenail. Reverend Pigfoot. Reverend Sunday Fried Chicken Eater. Reverend Hogmaw with the chitlin' juice running down his jaw. When I say, are you with me? That's like the preacher said, can I, can I, can I, can I get a amen? Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. Church say amen one more time. I just want to know if you're with me. Look at it. Brother Stevie Wonder. Again, we are wondering what this brilliant brother had on his mind this time. You're looking at the movie, but you must understand that there are two realities. One reality for the masses and another reality for the white controller. The white man sitting behind the scenes has another objective in mind. You want money in the bank. You want your picture on the front page of Newsweek magazine and the New York, I mean the New York Times. You want to be seen and honored and respected as one of the greats of this time. But the white man is making war for the minds and hearts of black people to keep us perpetually his slaves and to keep us in subjection under him or to him. So the conscious mind picks up one thing, but what does the subconscious mind pick up? You're watching the movie. Stevie Wonder singing in the background. Let's hear Stevie for a minute. Take but a minute. I thought they already had a cue. Take just a second. Maybe Stevie's thinking about it this time. We got to give the brother a chance. Let's listen to this carefully, and I've got the lyrics up here. While they're getting it together, we talked about this before, I don't know what happened. It's all right.
Turn it up a little bit. Is that Mac? So I can't talk? Yeah, the mic is back on. Let's listen. Let's stop it a minute. Let's look at the lyrics here. See what's going down into the subconscious mind. There's a devil by the name of Wilson Brian Key. And Wilson Brian Key, I said there's a devil named Wilson Brian Key. And Wilson Brian Key wrote a book called Subliminal Seduction. What is it called? Now, don't get fancy on you. All subliminal seduction means is slick rape of the mind. Another devil by the name of Van Packard wrote a book called The Hidden Persuaders. The Hidden Persuaders and Subliminal Seduction. We even found later that there's a way to manipulate music so that you can have a sub-lyric going, sub-lyrics going on and a sub-musical message going on while people are listening to the main track, you've got something else going on under that one which is making suggestions to the subconscious mind. Is this a wicked devil? He is wickedly wise. We even found that he could take a movie and he could sneak in on certain frames a message subliminally that he wanted only the subconscious to pick up, but the conscious mind might miss because you're looking at the major and the overall picture, but when certain frames come up, that frame or those frames are hitting you with a picture that is making an imprint or an impression on your subconscious mind. Are you with me? While you are listening to the words, the dialogue, in Jungle Fever, and at different points, Stevie's music comes in, or when you pop it in the, on the CD in the car, or the CD at home, or the cassette in the car at home. We're just listening to the voice of Stevie, which is one of the most beautiful voices that we've ever heard. We're listening to our man, Stevie, genius in his own time but we are failing to understand the subliminal message under Stevie. Let's look at what he's saying here. In one of his songs, talking to the white woman, he said, gotta have you, gotta have you, gotta have you for me, gotta have you, gotta have you at my side. Wait a minute, Stevie. What do you mean you got to have this white woman? What do you mean you got to have this cracker? Gotta have you, gotta have you for me, gotta have you for me. You, white woman, you are my reality. Wait a minute, Stevie. What happened to the black woman? The white woman is your reality. You gotta have her for me, meaning yourself. He goes on to say, all are created equal to hell with all these ignorant people. How they looking at us and staring at us. All are created equal to hell with all these ignorant people. We got to stop that black man. Let's look a little further. We got to stop that black woman. If the black man won't stop it, you stop it. Because they say we're the wrong color. Staring, glaring, laughing, looking like we've done something wrong because we show love strong. Get real, come on, calling us names, too bad to mention, but we pay them no attention. For colorblind or inner feelings, if we feel happiness 
and know our loves the best, forget their mess. You gonna make a case for the white woman? That's our problem today. This black woman has stood by us, black man, even when our raggedy behinds were weak on the plantation during slavery. This black woman stood by you, black man. She never let you down. This black woman, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teach us that no nation can rise higher than its woman. I repeat, no nation can rise higher than its woman. That the woman is the hallmark of civilization. But that black woman, that black woman, she's the mother of civilization, queen of the planet Earth and goddess of the universe. Before the black woman, there were none. And after the black woman, there will be no more. From the womb of the black woman came the brown, came the red, came the yellow, and yes, from the womb of the black woman came the white man and the white woman. According to the Mendelian law, what kind of law? Mendel said, that black is dominant and white is what? Mendel said that black is strong and white is what? Mendel said that the dark eye, the brown eye, the black eye is strong and dominant, but Mendel said that the blue eye is weak and recessive. Mendel said that that good hair, that nappy stuff, that strong that stuff that when the water hits it, it stands up on your head like a million black power fists standing up on top of your head, forming a crown on top of your head. I know some of you like your scary curls, meaning you scared to face yourself, scared to face reality. And some of you running around here with this blonde hair in your bleached blonde hair on your silly black nappy head. <laughs> scary curl and blonde hair on top of your silly black nappy head. And some of you have the nerve to even put in some blue-eyed contact, which means that you have lost contact with reality and lost contact with your black self. I ain't studying about that old, I ain't studying about that old Farquhar's Meg. I ain't studying him. I, blondes have more fun, honey. Fool, you haven't had no more fun running around here with that blonde mess in your head. You should go back to the way God made you. You should wear a sweatshirt. You should wear a t-shirt. You should wear a button that says, I'm nappy, but I'm happy. Let everybody know that I'm nappy and I'm happy. You must be the way God has made you. God made no mistake with you, black woman. He made no mistake with you, black man. He made you the best. I don't want no white woman with no stringy hair. You put your hand in there and you get ready to get a little good feeling from just running your strong black fingers through her hair and you slip and almost break your neck hand running through that stringy dog stuff. I want a woman with good hair. I want a woman with that good nappy hair. That when you stick your hand in her hand, she knows that she gonna hold on to you. Because when you stick your hand in there, you can't get it out. You're working to get it out. You won't be doing the crack dance. You'll be doing the black dance. You'll be doing the black dance. I want some hair that when I stick it in there, my fingers get all entwined and entangled in the hat, in that good hat. But now you got it fried and dyed and waved and curled all to the side. Temporary permanent. So how in the hell you went for that? They tell you big as day, fool, this is temporary. But they call it a permanent. You pay full price 
for something that is temporary and call it a permanent at the same time. But you just out of your mind. You just a white man nigga in 1991, getting ready to be his nigga in 1992. You out of your mind. You got jungle fever. You go white boy crazy or white girl crazy, and they go white black boy or black girl hazy. That's the people who have lost the knowledge of themselves. This black woman has always been with us, black man. Don't you let the white man tell you that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan is teaching the black woman to walk 15 steps or 10 steps behind the black man. Don't you believe it, sisters? We got some sisters that we got to run 15 steps to catch up with. They ain't not no 15 steps behind us. Say, but you want to keep us in the kitchen, cooking and barefoot and pregnant and fat all the time. That's not what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches. That's not what the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan is teaching for the liberation and salvation of the black nation. You want to know what they teach, sister? Do you want to know, sister? Well, hell, I won't tell you if you don't want to know. Do you want to know? They teach that home is the woman's base, but not necessarily her place. What do they teach? Home, talk black to me, I mean talk back to me. Let's do it together. Home is the woman's base, but not necessarily her what? Home is the woman's base, but not necessarily her place. They teach us that home is the black woman's headquarters. That's her base. But she might be a pilot. She might be an ambassador. She might be a doctor. She might be a lawyer. She might be a teacher. She might be a minister. She might be a scientist. She might be a mathematician. She might be one who studies the problems of her people and comes up with solutions for her people. The black woman can go into any field that her God-given talents will take her into, as long as it does not in any way compromise what we consider the divine and the divine and the holy spirit that God has created the black woman in. But this black woman has been at our side, black man, on everything we do. I've seen wino pee running all down in their shoes. Every time they walk, their shoes go. And you look one step next to him, here's a black woman. Come on, baby. Here he is, sloppy drunk. Don't even know who in the hell he is. Black woman right there, he almost falls. She catch him. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. She studies him a little bit. He walks a little straight. Black woman, strong black woman, at his side. When he veers to the right, she's there to gear him and steer him back. Go too far to the left. She's there to pull him back on the path. I've seen junkies. Nodding, stretching. Black woman right there. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. In Mozambique, in Angola, in Guinea-Bissau, in Namibia, in South Africa, on the plantations of America, the black woman has always been at the side of the black man. Fighting in the wars against the enemy, black woman, with a baby strapped to one breast, another baby strapped to her back, might have two babies, twins, one on one nipple, the other one on the other nipple, a baby on her back and an automatic weapon in her hand, killing the Portuguese, killing the French, killing the Dutch, killing the English, killing all of them. Baby's head bobbing on the nipple. Black woman mowing them down. But as soon as the damn war is over, black man leave the black woman in the bush and go after the Portuguese dog. That's what I said. Go after the French white woman. Go after the British or the English white woman. 
after the black woman has fought with him and helped him gain his independence and liberation. After she's gone through fainting and pain and the shedding of blood to bring babies made in his image and after his likeness into the world. You remember the character Nilda that Sister Phyllis Yvonne Stickney played in what they call the War Council? And she said that every time the black man gets up a little bit, he leaves the black woman and go get him a white woman? You know we're not lying. What about old tall, lanky Will Chamberlain? He wrote a book, didn't he? And in Will Chamberlain's book, Will Chamberlain said that a black woman couldn't do anything for him. He said black women couldn't communicate on his level. That black women had not had enough experience for him. Wonder what did he say about his mama? He said only white women had traveled enough to communicate with him. Only white women had enough experience in life to communicate and to sit down and conversate with Mr. Wilt Chamberlain. Big, long, lanky, long, tall, tall drink of water fool running after the white man's woman. Jungle fever fool. What about Arcelio Hall? You know Arcelio. A R O S I L L Y O Arcilio, the Arcilio Hall Show. Here's a real fool. Don't let one of them big-legged white girls come on the show. Or he'll jump over and sit on her lap. Or he'll sit next to her and rub on her back. Or he'll pull her over on his lap. Or he'll start talking sex talk to her to feel her out and see if he can get with her after the show is over. I'm talking about goddamn us. Arcelio Hall. What about dying alone? You know dying alone? What about disgrace Jones? Don't you know Disgrace Jones? What about Silly D. Williams? What about the Dead Fox? What about Richard Fire or Richard Fryer? What about LeVar Hurton, who played Kunta Kinte in Roots? How in the hell are you going to play Kunta Kinte in Roots? and then leave the set and go out and every time I see you, you with a white woman. The only time I haven't seen him with a white woman is the time I saw him with two white women. Kunta Kinte. Lou Gossett used to always be with white women. They say one of them had an Eskimo. Now that's not too far out of the family. But still it's a little different for us. Hell, you look like with an Eskimo black man. Them big old pretty thick African lips of yours. You know, you like some loving black man. You like some real sugar black man. What you gonna do with your Eskimo wife? <laughs> Baby, you sure give up some good nose. <laughs> Come on, black man. Time to eat. You don't want an apple pie. You don't want a butternut squash pie. You don't want a cheese pie. You don't want a bean pie. You said, baby, go get me one of them Eskimo pies. What do you look like with an Eskimo, black man? 
You want everybody but the black woman. And now the black woman wants everybody but you. The white man systematically and psychologically tearing and ripping the black family apart. And you're going to bring me some goddamn jungle fever? Hell no for jungle fever. The black man must be with the black woman. The black woman must be with the black man. Jungle fever. I ain't taking no prisoners tonight. Spike is brilliant, but Spike needs to confer with somebody before he does these things. He can't just run out here. He's a great man in the movie making industry. He's a great writer, but he's not the visionary of our day. He doesn't have the divine guidance of the hour. He needs advice, he needs counsel. You can't take anything away from the brilliance and the genius and the qualifications that God has given to him, but he needs more than that. Don't tell me that this is an atomic bomb and you're playing with it, Spike. Don't tell me that this is a nuclear megaton bomb and you're playing with it. Who in the hell are you to play with a nuclear megaton bomb when the lives of black people are swinging and teetering in the balance? You need guidance. You need someone to talk to. You need someone that you can sit down with other than them crackers that you talk to. Look, I love Spike. Would love to walk with him, put my arm around him and sit with him, talk with him, walk with him, see him with the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan. But I can't let him off the hook because when you love, you are supposed to correct. When you don't love, then you don't care. And this is serious. Spike needs advice and he needs counsel during this critical hour. This black woman, again, who has done so much to strengthen us as black men because we have not been the men by you that we should be, sisters. We have been dehumanized. We have been emasculated. We have been robbed of a knowledge of self and reduced as men because the enemy and the oppressor always attacks the man because the man is the vanguard of the movement. He attacks the man because the man carries the atom of life for the furtherance of the species or the furtherance of that nation. So he attacks the man first. And once he destroys the man, then the woman becomes the spoils of war. The woman becomes the booty. And then he works on taking her mind over so that she will teach her baby, the black man's baby, in a way that will make them loyal to him and not loyal to their own people. Look at this devil. He's the master of trick knowledge. The Honorable, most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teach us that he's the master of tricknology, which means that he has made tricks and lies a science. He's a past master at tricks and lies, and he is a scientist who is wickedly wise. He's working when we are asleep. He's even working to put us to sleep. His genocide plan is in full force every day to get rid of us. But first, the battle is for the minds and hearts of the people. Spike Lee did not kick any doors down. You stop lying to yourself. Spike Lee did not go in this little brother so tough until the white folks had to, they, the white folks had to accept him. He didn't just walk in. And the white folks say, Spike is coming. White people decided to let Spike in. Why did they decide to let Spike in? Spike must ask that question. You must ask that question. We must ask that question. Yes, they let him in because he's talented and brilliant, but they don't normally let talented and brilliant black men and women in. What did they see that maybe our brother does not see? We want to protect our brother. We want to look out for our brother, and we want to look out for the masses of our people. What did they see that Spike didn't see? Spike could write a movie. Do they have to produce it? Spike could write it and produce it, and direct it. 
Do they have to distribute it? Do we have a distribution system? Somebody say, yeah, they got to distribute it. Do you know how many movies are written every day and people harass white folks all day and call them all night and still can't get the movie, put, get the movie on a screen nowhere but in the basement or in the attic of their house? When the white man decides to let you on the big screen, he has a reason for letting you on the big screen. You didn't kick down no doors. Stop fooling yourself. We love Spike. We're looking for heroes. We're looking for a champion. So we would like to believe that he's been such a champion until he's just bogarted and kicked the doors down and made them accept him. The white man, according to the Supreme Court justice, when they had the Plessy versus Ferguson case, they said that the United Snakes of America, the what? The what? That the United Snakes of America, white men have no, that black men have no right that the United Snakes of America or that the white man is bound, duty bound to respect. So they don't have to respect anything that we come up with. Once we understand that, the better off we will be. They let Brother Spike in. Let's look at a few things that our brilliant brother has done. In his movies, he always strips the black woman buck naked. He shows her to the world. She's got a habit. He strips her naked and lays her out before the world. All a woman. He lays her out before the world, naked and bare, for freakish crackers sitting in the audience to ogle and drool and, and dribble and dripping at the mouth, looking at our woman. Our nation can rise no higher than our woman. In school days, he takes the clothes off of the black woman. Am I lying to you? Even in Jungle Fever, in the opening scene, there's no real frontal nudity but he shows the breast of the character Drew, who is married to the character Flipper Purify. Shows her breast and everything. You don't see that white woman's breast not one time. You don't see that white woman's backside not one time. You don't see that white woman's stomach. Now her cross, they show you her blouse partially open with her bra on. But when he puts a black woman on the screen, they strip the black women naked. What's the matter with you, Spike? Why were you so careful with this white woman that you didn't strip her naked? If you're so conscious and if that was supposed to be doing the right thing, I wouldn't even suggest that he put the white woman on there and strip her naked. I don't want to look at no naked, silly, skinny, ugly white woman. But it's your movie, you're writing it, you're producing it, you're directing it. Why do you protect the image of the white woman but strip your woman and parade her before the world? Why does he make the white women smarter than the black women? In the movie Jungle Fever, the white character Angie, short for what? Short for what? Angela. Short for what? And the root of Angela is what? Is what? Angel. Angel food cake is what color? Devil's food cake is what color? You suppose that's got anything to do with any of this stuff that we're dealing with here? You got to be careful when you're dealing with a nuclear megaton bomb. You got to be careful when you're dealing with an atomic bomb when you're dealing with the liberation of your people and when their freedom is swinging in the battle. Look at it. The black woman, at the end of the movie, I'll move her back and forth, at the end of the movie, allows her husband, Flipper, back into the home, takes him back into the bedroom. They make love. She cries in pain and it's understandable. But when she finishes making love to her husband, she puts him out of the house. She wants him to leave. Makes it look like the black woman, and I was listening to Dr. Karenga 
on some of these points also. We were together this weekend. Makes it look like the black woman can't resolve conflict. That the black woman can't work anything out and that she's such a sapphire or such a itch with a bee until she takes the man back into her arms and into her bed, but she won't allow him to stay at home even though the child is happy that mom and dad are back together again. But look how they play the white girl, the character Angie. Angie is so heavy. Angela, the white girl, is so strong until, if you'll notice, she left Flipper Purified. Did she leave him or did he leave her or did they leave each other at the same time? Didn't he wake up one night in the middle of the night or one morning and reach over there and was she there? She was what? As they say down south, she gone. She been gone. She was gone. He said, he said, uh, uh. Oh, he raised up, and the white woman had raised up. She was gone. He looked disappointed. Wait a minute, Spike. Why didn't you give the black man some redeeming qualities? Why didn't you make the black man come to his senses and come to a sense of black pride and black consciousness that made him see his wrong and amend his ways? Why did you leave him in the bed after he had left his wife and his baby with this cracker in the bed and leave the cracker as the one that would leave him? The white woman had more sense than him and all of them. She left him and went back to her white boyfriend, Polly, didn't she? And Polly didn't want her no more because she had been with that nigger man. Did you hear me? He didn't mind being with the nigger woman because that's the history of what they have done to our women, but he couldn't accept her back anymore because she had been with a nigger man. And so she went running back to him after she left the black man, Flipper Purified, who had flipped over and flip-flopped on the black nation and flip-flopped on his black wife and baby and is in much need even after the movie was over and the scores and the credits had run, he was still in need and all of us are in need of being purified because the white man has flipped us over, left him. She went back, mended the fences with her family, didn't she? Her father received her back. Her white boyfriend who rejected her got beat up. Whose door did he knock on? Black woman's door. Did the black woman let him in? Did the black woman welcome him in? Did the black woman close the door and lock the door behind her? Did we ever see him come out? How long did he stay? Did he stop just in the living room? Did he go to the bathroom? I wonder, did he make it to get something out of the refrigerator in the kitchen? No, no, no. Did he get to the bedroom. Why, if you are the writer, the producer, and the director, why did you leave the black woman in that shape? Why did you make that beautiful black woman say to that white man when he hit on her, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I don't know. I never looked at you that way, Paulie. I'll have to think about it. Why did you let the movie end? And we don't know, we didn't see her in a 15-second segment, nor a 20-second segment say to the white boy, I'm sorry, Paulie, I just don't take this route. I can't go down that road or that street. I know it's a dead end, Paulie. I just can't go that way. I think you're all right for getting my newspaper from. You're a nice paper boy, Paulie. The candy in your store is nice, Polly, but I can't go this route. Just take a few seconds and leave the sister's image intact. But they left the sister behind closed doors with the white man, and we don't know what happened behind them door. We know he had already said he liked her, and we know that every morning that she came in, she made eyes at him. And some of you have become that way after having been robbed of a knowledge of yourself. That's why you hated Shaharazad Ali for pulling the cover off of you. Because some of you, 
not all of you, not all of you, but many of you go up in these white folks' tall ivory tower plantations and let them pinch on you, feel on you, tell you nasty jokes and composition you. Or you want a movie position so you'll flip flop with them in order to be seen on the big screen. No principle at all. What's your price? What kind of prostitute are we? These are questions that we must ask. Let's go even further than that. As we look at it, the father of Flipper Purified, the father of Brother Gator. Gator was something. <laughs> that Gator was something, wasn't he? I'm a crack, crack, crackhead. I love to get high. Let me dance for you, mama. The father at the end ends up doing what? Killing his son the way Marvin Gaye's father killed him. Oh, Brother Ozzy Davis, magnificent and brilliant actor. Sister Ruby, magnificent and brilliant also. If you got a gun and you're so fed up with the life of your son and you say he shouldn't live anymore, why can't you use that same gun to sentence the cracker to death who put your son in that condition? Listen to me and listen to me, girl. You listening? You listening? The problem is not with the crack. The problem is with the cracker. The problem is not with the crack. The problem is with who? Let's say it together. The problem is not with the crack. The problem is with the cracker. Because the crack comes in, the dope comes in on trucks and trains and boats and planes. You know you don't have no trucks and trains and boats and planes. Hell, you don't even have a canoe. How are you going to bring some dope in? The white man brings the dope in. You're not no chemist. You know you got a F in chemistry here at Boys and Girls High School. A PS, whatever the number was. Hell, you can't even remember that number. Every time you try to make up something, you blow up the whole house or the whole damn block. The white man is the king. He's the big drug dealer. You deal in drugs and deal in death to your people for a few diamond rings and flashy things. Pink Cadillac with the diamond in the back, leaning to the side with a case to lean. Sissy! Because that's what you are. When you will take the black woman and pimp the black woman so that you can buy dope or pimp the black woman so you can buy diamond rings and fancy things and gold chains and don't have nothing on your brain. You're not a pimp. You're a punk. You're a sissy. Nothing but a sissy. You pimping for peanuts and Cadillacs. And the white man is dealing in nations, worlds, and continents. You're doing it for diamond rings. And he's doing it for diamond mines. And capturing mines. Public enemy say it's not the gold chain, it's the gold brain. Huh? You can't outsteal the white man. If you want to beat the white man, you beat the white man at good. If you want to beat the white man, you beat the white man at righteousness. You can't beat this cracker stealer. Hell, he stole you. How you gonna steal somebody who stole you? <laughs> you gonna steal somebody who stole you. Does that make sense? 
balance, you gotta apply the myotic balance here. Truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, order, and reciprocity. This is rooted in your nature, black woman. Rooted in your nature, black man. Let's go back. Cover a few more points with the, with the fever. Because the fever is serious. Let's look at it. And plus, we're going to touch on Malcolm X for a minute. Because we know that our brother is getting ready to do Malcolm X. He's got to have some guidance before doing Malcolm X. He could set our people back three decades. He could set our people back 30 years, 40 years, if it's not done right. Are you going to vilify the most honorable Elijah Muhammad on the screen? Are you going to make him the one who gave the order for some fool to pull the trigger to kill Brother Malcolm? Is that the way you're going to show the honorable Elijah Muhammad on the screen? I got to ask that question. When you put yourself in that position, Brother Spike, we are taught that this unity breeds murder. And when you put yourself in that position, this slick enemy devil, we love you. We will work with you. We will walk with you. We will sit with you. We will research and dig and search with you. But this enemy will manipulate a situation like that. And the enemy could kill Brother Spike Lee and then try to lay his murder at the door of the nation of Islam. Just quickly, how are you going to show Malcolm? Are you going to show most of his early life when he's a hustler and a con man? These young brothers and sisters love Malcolm X. Do you love Malcolm? How are you going to show Malcolm? Are you going to show him as a gangster and a cheap con man and a dope dealer and a man that's chasing white women? Are you going to put Malcolm on the screen and make him kiss a white woman on the screen? The book talks about his relationship with white women, doesn't it? The book says it was white girls that caused him to get busted and go to prison, doesn't it? Are you going to show him in bed with the white women? Are you going to show him holding hands with them, kissing them? Are you going to show Malcolm as a savage who had not gained the knowledge of himself holding some white woman and grinding on her against the wall in an alley somewhere or on a barroom stool somewhere? You've got to be careful how you deal with this thing. Not only from the perspective of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, but from the perspective of Malcolm also. A lot of counsel, a lot of advice, a lot of searching and researching. I have the tape from BET, where Brother Spike was on BET. It hurt my heart. I love the brother so much. She said, have you spoken to Minister Farrakhan yet? And at that time, he had not. Now he has. And he said, uh, no, we keep missing each other. She said, in words, what does Minister Farrakhan think about you doing jungle fever? In words, he said, he didn't care what Minister Farrakhan said. He went on to say, I'm going to tell the truth. Then he went on to say something that really hurt me. He said the nation of Islam had a hand in the murder or the assassination of Malcolm X, and I intend to tell that. I'm looking at it. I brought the video with me to the city of New York. I was told this in several audiences, but I wouldn't repeat it until I received the video and sat and looked at that segment myself. I said, oh, Brother Spike. Have not you read the counterintelligence program of the FBI, COINTELPRO, where they said they're looking for the rise of a black messiah who could unify the masses of black people and electrify them and set their minds and hearts and souls on fire, but that that black leader and the primary and the key black organization and movement of that day, that he would discredit that leader, discredit that organization, in the minds and hearts of the people and also in the minds and hearts of the radical element. Make the nationalists hate the leader of the day. Make the pan-Africanists and the socialists hate the leader of the day. Make the conscious Muslims of the Islamic organizations hate the leader of that day. Make the 5% nation hate the leader of that day. 
make the Zulu nation hate the leader of that day. The FBI says we must discredit this leader and discredit the organization in every way that we can. Discredit them among the radical and militant elements. Brother Spike, there are too many conscious black people left around that believe that the nation of Islam killed Malcolm. Most have done the research. Most have done the study by now. How many of you know that the United States government had a hand in the murder? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, you don't know what I'm going to ask. Had a hand in the murder of the Attorney General, that old white boy, Kennedy. How many believe that the government had a hand in Kennedy's murder? Hands down. How many believe that the government, the United States of America, that the government had a hand in the killing of John Kennedy, the president of the United States? Now, this is their own. How many of you believe that the United States government had a hand in the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Hands down. How many of you believe that the United States government had a hand in the overthrow and the ultimate death of Brother Patrice Lumumba in the Congo? How many of you believe that the United States government had a hand in the toppling of the government of Osage Fokwami in Kuma in Ghana and Emil Gabral in Guinea-Bissau. How many of you believe that the United States government is responsible for the murder of Malcolm X El Haj Malik El Shabazz? How many turn your cameras here? How many hold your hands high? If you don't believe it, don't raise your hand. Don't tell a little white lie, buddy. Don't tell a big black one either. Hands high. These are the hands of those who believe what? That the what? This is hands down. I'll just take your hands now, but during the question and answer period, I'll give you an opportunity. How many of you believe that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan had something to do with the murder of Minister Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Shabazz. Raise your hand. Turn your camera. Not one hand. You see, brothers and sisters, we had nothing to do with Malcolm's murder. This shouldn't be put on the screen to confuse the masses of our people. We've got to get to our brother and appeal to our brother to sit with us and let's go after the research, brother. You say you want to do the right thing? Let's do the right thing. Back to jungle fever. For this to be seen all over the world, what effect do you think this has? Now they're coming all up out of the closet. You saw them in the lines at the movies. More interracial couples than you could count all across the country. All out on the West Coast. All out here on the East Coast. Even down South. I have met with Brother Wesley Snipe. You want to know about Brother Wesley Snipe? You really want to know about him? You want to know? You sure? Because I don't know. You know, you know how we are. If you say, do you see that guy over there? You see that man over there? That man came up with a cure for AIDS. He's one of the foremost scientists of our day. You say, oh, is that right? You say, you see that man over there? The guy likes little boys. He takes little boys in the toilet and hides in the stall and look, is that right? Where is he? Do you really want to hear this about Brother Wesley Snipes? Brother Wesley Snipes is a conscious black man. Brother Wesley Snipes is digging and searching in the history book. He's digging in the Medunetta. He has tapes of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan stacked that high. He has a library of tapes. He studies the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We, we had dinner together just last week. We were together a little earlier than that. He's shooting another movie called White Boys Can't Jump or something. <laughs> out in, uh, but don't let that fool you, though. 
this white boy could jump. And he and Wesley win a lot of money because nobody wants to choose the white boy because they say white boys can't jump. But they win all the money. You'll, you'll see it. It's coming out. This brother is black. Black, black. And he's concerned about the masses of his people. We sat down and we talked about this. We talked about this at length. Some say they didn't like the picture because he's lower than the white woman. He said he didn't want the picture with him higher than the white woman. He said because he didn't want it to look like he was cherishing this white woman. And he was looking down at her and holding her in his arms. So he said he would rather look like she was cherishing him rather than him cherishing her and endearing her to him. He's very concerned about this. Now he played the role because he's one of the greatest actors we got. He played Nino Brown. He played quite well in Most Better Blues. I mean, he's the, one of the rising stars of our day. And Brother's studies, his studies are preparing him so that he can do some great things and great work among our people. Most of you know Sister Phyllis Yvonne Stickney. Some know her by the name Polake. Some know her by her name Oshun Yemenya, Mayat, Muhammad. We know that in everything that she comes out in, she's Afrocentric. She's black. She wears them out with her blackness. It hurt me to see Spike take the black woman who is Miss Afrocentricity and give her the lead lines. Girl, we're going to have to start dating white men. Why you give those lines to Phyllis Stickney? Why not give it to one of the other sisters who other sisters are not looking to for black pride and black consciousness? Why didn't you give it to a sister who's not working to organize a black sisterhood and always working among black women? Why put those lines in her mouth? Girl, we're going to have to start dating white men. And if you'll notice in the movie, even Cyrus, Spike's character, Spike played the role of Cyrus, I think. Is that, was, is that his name? What is his name? Cyrus. Even his wife didn't have anything to say good about black men, did she? She said, girl, they all dogs. I guarantee you none of them are any good. They all dogs. Well, that included Cyrus. We didn't see Cyrus do anything wrong. Even in their private conversations, we didn't hear Cyrus even really say anything that was off base, did we? But the black woman in that movie, I was glad to hear one of the sisters say, we want a true Asiatic black man, she said. Then others made references to all kinds of stuff that didn't even make no sense. You know what I'm talking about. It's the white man, as I near my conclusion, so we can get to some of the questions in here tonight. It's the white man who's concerned with penis size and that kind of thing. This black woman, I tell her, I'm going to get me a true Zulu. Endowed, well endowed, so he can keep me happy. That's not what keeps you happy, black woman. It's not what's between his legs, it's what is in his head and in his heart that will keep you happy. And black man, Stop going after the white, I mean, stop going after the black woman for the holes in her body. Go after the whole woman, not just the holes in her body. When we begin to focus on these things, we'll be a better people. Now all the crackheads, I walk the streets a little today. The crackheads are doing this crack dance on the street. They've made Gator a hero. They walk up to your car and do a dance. That's damaging, Brother Spike. Let's change the crack dance to the black dance. What about when Spike came out in school days with doing the butt? 
I mean, just as silly. Oh, sexy, sexy now. You in the butt. And a sister would jump down on the floor with a big tight, with tight pants on. I mean, pants that were tight, 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 tight. And sister would jump out on the floor. And brother wouldn't make it no better. Brother jump behind her. Do it in the butt. You cannot become a free, proud, and productive people. You cannot become an independent people. You cannot become a liberated people looking like a fool doing the butt. Somebody should beat your butt, whip your butt, get your butt up, black woman. Got your behind up in a man's face. What do you look like getting down, putting your putting your, you know, in a man's face. And then tell me, respect me. <laughs> respect me for my mind, honey. Respect me for my mind. Well, why didn't you show him your mind instead of your behind? Dresses as short as my bow tie. Dresses cut so low until you walk down the aisle in one of these meetings or one of these churches, the babies go to cry and this dress cut so low they think it's feeding time. No bra on. Breast bobbing and bouncing in a man's face. Looking like Channel 6 Jiggle TV. Man discussing freedom and independence. The liberation and salvation of the black nation, discussing how we can get out of this condition, and here you come with your tight, tight pants on with the V in the front. They're so tight until they form a V in the front, and the V points to the point. And no bra and your breast bouncing in your clothes. And since the eye is made to follow moving objects, the black man is trying to discuss getting out of this condition, and here you come, and all eyes on you. <laughs> we must get the black family together and cure this jungle feast. But black man, you must respect the black woman. Black woman, you must respect respect yourself. You must not attract a man on cheap principles. That you 36, 22, 36, and you think you got it all figured out. What are you going to do when time starts to work a work on your 36? What are you going to do when time starts to work a work and your volleyball turns to a basketball and later turns to a beach ball. What are you going to do, black woman? Dribbling all over the place. Attracted your man on cheap principles. But then when the form is gone, then the man would be gone after another. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan say that the black woman must attract a man on the, her charm, on her grace, on her poise, on her knowledge, on her wisdom, must attract a man on her spirituality, must attract a man on her consciousness and pride and dignity and honor and respect in her high, noble, sublime character and the principles of divinity that she has placed and centralized and internalized in her life and in her heart. This is how you must attract a man. When you attract a man like that, sister, you got him. You got him. You got him. He ain't going after Miss Floozy Tuesday. He ain't going after Angie. And you should be angry when you see your man with a white woman. Not enough black men as it is. Nilda also says that, the character Nilda Phyllis Sickness. She said many of us are black men are in prison. On crack, are we, 
We switching, honey. That's something else we got to stop around New York. Pull this black family together. You can't be switching around here, black man. You're not no homosexual, no sissy by nature. You're God's man. God is in you, black man. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad say, when you look at the black man, you're looking at God. When you look at the black woman, you're looking at the goddess of the universe. You got this freakishness from the white man. Now here in New York City and San Francisco and all these crazy cities, black men switching all up and down the street. Straighten yourself up, black man. We need to get us a roller skate squad. Black Liberation Roller Skate Squad. If we catch, catch you disgracing us. We catch prince or princess up on the stage naked and clothes all off acting like a woman and the Roller Skate Squad come in on the stage <laughs> with a razor strap or an ironing card and get the whipping princess naked behind princess whip princess all off the stage. Catch Michael Faxon, Faxon on the stage and make him moonwalk off the stage, acting like that. This is one of the best entertainers of all time. Broke all kinds of records. White folks came matching, and our heart goes out to him. But we also have to correct him because he is our family. Black man wasn't no homosexual in Africa. Can you imagine the big tall Watusi? Seven three. Tall as the tree. Walking through the jungle talking about how booty gani, baby. How booty gani, honey. How booty gani. Hell you mean how booty got it. Sister walking around trying to be a man. One of the little, what they call pygmies, but what we call the twa, walking around talking about hotel, honey. Hotel. <laughs> That's not our nature. We picked that up from these people. Let's give them that back. Integration is an experiment. Did you hear what I said? Integration is not natural. Integration is an experiment. If you go to China primarily, what kind of people do you see? If you go to Japan primarily and essentially, what kind of people do you see? If you go to Germany primarily and essentially, what kind of people do you see? If you go to blue, black Africa primarily, what kind of people do you see? It's America with this damn melting pot policy. And fool, you've been hit in the head with the pot and what was in the pot was poured on you hot, but you have not assimilated, you have not integrated into this mix. There's been no American dream, only an American nightmare for you black man and woman. All we got is each other black man and woman. We got to pull together. No white man should be able to come between us. No white woman should be able to come between us. The basis of a community is the family and the basis of nation building is the family. The family must be made strong. And so we can't allow jungle fever, nor any other kind of fever, to destroy that. Now, Spike brilliantly has people talking about this all over the country. Dialogue has been opened up. But many will miss the dialogue. They just go by what they saw on the screen. And they will go out imitating what they saw on the screen. Why do all of our movies have to show us as clowns and buffoons and drunkards and dope deals. Why? Don't we do anything other than that? Come on, that's reality. Who's reality? And if it's reality, is that the reality that we want to actually promote? Is that the, uh, 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 the actual reality that we want to represent in a way that people will attempt to imitate it? When are we going to show some positive things on the screen that will turn our people around? But these are black exploitation movies where you ex 
exploit the weakness of the people. You exploit the ignorance of our people. You exploit the fact that our people are deaf, dumb, and blind. Robbed of a knowledge of self. I'm the voice that you hear on Public Enemy. Just after Flav, you know Flav. <laughs> after Flav gets through doing, she watched Channel Zero. And just before Chuck D comes on with This Is A Dope Jam, I'm the voice that you hear that says, have you forgot that when we were brought here, we were robbed of our name, robbed of our language. We lost our religion, our culture, our God. And many of us, by the way we act, we even lost our mind. And that is the condition that we are in today as a people. We have lost our mind. We have absolutely lost our mind, and the white man is using this condition. So we who are writers, producers, directors, we who are actors and athletes, we cannot play into that and help the enemy to further degrade our people and walk on our people and spit on our people. A couple of more points. May I cover these points? <laughs> Dr. Francis Cress Welding. Dr. Welsing, let me get a little bit of this. In her book, The Isis Papers, the keys to the what? The keys to the what? The Isis Papers, the keys to the colors. And in her quest theory dealing with white supremacy, she tells us Something that drew Cyrus' wife in the movie Jungle Fever, the, the little science and a little light that she dropped out. She told him when he came to visit her at Bloomingdale, prestigious Bloomingdale, and as he was walking into Bloomingdale, integrated couples were walking through Bloomingdale. One of the integrated couple strolls by. Another integrated couple strolls by. What is this doing to the subconscious mind? How is this programming the subconscious mind? She says to him in her office as a buyer for Bloomingdale's department store, she says, white people, in words, hate black people because they can't be black people. <laughs> Dr. Welsing in the ISIS papers, The Keys to the Colors, tells us that the white man has a fear of genetic annihilation. What does he have a fear of? <laughs> Say it one more time. One more time. Genetic annihilation. The white man has a fear of genetic annihilation. Public enemy put it this way, that it is a fear of a what? Of a what? Of a what? Fear of a black planet because they know that black is dominant and white is recessive. They know that black is strong and white is weak. And everywhere the white man went and impregnated the women of the brown, red, and yellow peoples of the earth and the black people of the earth, whenever he made it back to that spot, the baby was the color of the parent that he had left behind. Brown, red, yellow, or black. He realized that his genetic recessiveness could completely annihilate him and destroy him. So subconsciously, he became preoccupied with color. Preoccupied with color and preoccupied with his inferiorization. Subconscious inferiorization. Drew's lines were perfect lines that Brother Spike put into her mouth. Look at it. Dr. Welsing says that the games that people play, sport games, tell you something about what those people are thinking about. You with me? Church, say amen. Say amen again. Say amen one more time. All right, I'm, yeah. See where you are. 
That's another thing we see all throughout jungle fever. Everybody had on a cross. Uh, white Jesus on the wall. Uh, did a turn and shot the picture. You say, now wait a minute, you were doing all right. Now you're talking about shooting the Lord Jesus. What's the matter with that man? Let Lord, child, Lord, have mercy, Jesus, let me get out of here before lightning strike that man up there talking about Jesus. I'm not talking about Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Redeemer and my Lord and my Master. But I believe that Jesus is a black man from among us. Jesus is a black man from among us. The Bible said he would have hair like lamb's wool. It would be that nappy stuff. His body, his feet would be like fine brass as though it had been burnt in a what? The Bible said Jesus would be a burnt black man with nappy hair. Then where did you get this blue-eyed, pale-skinned, buttermilk complexion, white peck of wood with the blonde hair that you got hanging up on your wall? Take that cracker off of your wall. That's not Jesus. Take that peck of wood off of your wall. That's, that's Jesus. And this here, and this, this here, this here picture right here, this picture right here, this is the lo this is the Last Supper. Uh, hell, I see why you hungry in Brooklyn and Harlem, hell, and Queens. You didn't get nothing to eat that day because you didn't have no seat at that table. Everybody at that table is white. 13 white men sitting at a table and you claim you so hip, hip slick, cute and cool, but yet you'll go for it. The Bible said God is no respecter of person. God is concerned with the righteous and those who are most mindful of their duty and the following of his word and his law. Is that right? Then if God is no respecter of person, why is there a table with 13 crackers sitting at the table? Where's the Chinese at the table? Where's the Japanese at the table? Where's the so-called red Indian at the table? Huh? Where's the black African at the table? Where's the woman at the table? Why are there no women sitting at the table? If you were at the Last Supper, you must have been cooking. You must have been going to bust the table when they got through eating. You weren't in there to eat. Take them 13 crackers off your wall. Go home and snatch that cracker off the wall. Get out from here and throw it on the floor and drop kick that cracker out of your house. Kick that cracker out of your house. You should be mad when you look at it when you get home. Say, you should run to the thing and grab it and snatch it up. Do the blackhead dance, not the crackhead dance. Do the blackhead dance on that picture because you've been fooled by that picture for so long. No white man is gonna save you from nothing. No white man is gonna save you. No white man with a white robe and some chicken wings gonna come flying down out of the sky. And even if he did, hell, you wouldn't wait around for nothing. And you're not going to grow no wings on your black rusty back and go fly it up in the sky. Heaven is not in the sky, fool. Did you hear what I said? If I say something that offends you, just say, you ain't talking about me. I'm talking about the other fella. Heaven is not in the sky. Hell is not under the ground. The devil is not some mystery man under the ground with some red pantyhose on and a pitchfork that's going to jug you and stick you on a barbecue pit, roasting you and turning you forever. God is not a white man in the sky, fool. Kick back on a sealy possipede mattress on a cloud somewhere. Some of you can't wait to die. I can. The Pope of Rome could. 
They shot the Pope. He's supposed to be the right hand of God. He's supposed to be admitted into paradise instantly. They shot the Pope and the paramedics and everybody came. The Pope was supposed to say, He's supposed to say, get away from me. Nobody touch me. I don't want that oxygen tank. I don't want you to stop the internal bleeding. I don't want you to take these bullets out of me. I'm going to heaven. I'm on my way to glory. They got the best doctors they can find for this no good cracker. Because this cracker know that everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven. Heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven. So that cracker knew he wasn't going nowhere but in a box in the ground. There's no heaven in the sky. Heaven is called the hereafter. What does here mean? Here means in this place. What does here mean? Heaven is called the what? Talk black to me. What is it called? The what? Don't be afraid to shatter the old white theology from the slave church that you've been going to, to the slave masjid that you've been going to. Some of you go to a slave church, a slave cathedral, a slave mosque, and a slave masjid where you bow down to white people and make your prayers and your salat and you look up to white people for the interpretation and exegesis and translation of Bible and Quran. To hell with the cracker scholars of the world. God has raised up a fountain of wisdom in our midst, and that man is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the extension of his work is the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. I wouldn't follow the Pope nowhere follow him and snatch that robe up and see what his crack is hiding under there. <laughs> Just like the Statue of Liberty out there in the harbor. Nothing but the whore in the harbor. Some of you will eat more barbecue and drink more, so drink more soda, pop or whatever. American flags all on your car and yellow ribbons and stuff. Just as silly as you can be. Lord, child, Lord, have mercy, Jesus, Lord, Lord, have mercy. It's the 4th of July. Lord, have mercy. It's Independence Day. Oh, you're not independent. You don't own a pot nor a window. You don't own a brick or stick nor a blade of grass. You don't own a rock or rail or spike or spoke nor a huff or a puff of smoke. You don't own nothing. If the white man didn't make toilet paper, you'd be running through Brooklyn with cement, brown cement holding your cheeks together, running through Brooklyn. You'd be doing the doo-doo. <laughs> you'd, you'd raise up from that seat and pull the seat up with you. Cheeks be cemented together. Be a brown day in Brooklyn. Be a brown day in Harlem. Don't even make toilet paper. Talking about it's Independence Day. Oh, July 4th, 1776. What were we doing? Don't talk silly to me. I don't know what you were doing, nigga, but I wasn't here. I wasn't here in no 1776. You were here in 1776. You didn't fall out of the sky. You didn't pop up out of the ground. You were in your mom and your daddy who was in their mom and their daddy who was in their mom and in their daddy. You are a link in the chain for the great continuum called life. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the ancient of days. You are the alpha and omega in one sense, but in another sense you have no beginning nor, nor, nor an ending. You have no birth record. You are the original Asiatic black man and woman of the planet Earth. Why Asiatic black man Elijah Muhammad? Why Asiatic black man Louis Farrakhan? Why not the African black man? Why not the African black woman? I'm here to take no prisoners tonight. We're running the statistics and dealing with the realistics, and we're going to kick the ballistics until the house comes down or the roof come off the house.
I'll get back to heaven and hell in a minute. But hell, we got to look at this thing. We got to figure a way to get the hell out of hell. Don't you want to get the hell out of hell? Sure you do. Look at it. And look at it for what it's really worth. Weighing it. Heaven and hell. But also looking at the fact that, well, let's pin that before we lose it. The other point, dealing with your holidays and dealing with all of that, let's pin that too. We got enough time to cover it all. But I don't want to lose the point. I'm looking in some of these faces on heaven and hell. What's our other point after heaven and hell? What was it? That's it. It was the Asiatic black man. You hold that and black woman, right? Instead of what? Now that's something I want to let it rock and roll around in your head for a minute. There's no heaven in the sky, no hell under the ground. Are you with me? So teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. We do not believe in spookism, we believe in spiritualism. We don't believe in what? We believe in what? Spookism is an intense emotional commitment to a non-existent nothing. Should I run that by you again? We don't believe in spookism, we believe in spiritualism. Spookism is an intense emotional commitment to a non-existent nothing. Shazam! Abra Kadabra. And you still never get out of the condition that you're in. Praying to a mystery God. Sitting at home waiting for the mystery God to bring you food, clothing, and shelter. Looking up in the sky thinking that heaven is going to come out of the sky. And too scared to look dig or a hole too deep. Scared you're going to run into the devil. White man got you looking up in the sky. He's down in what he told you was hell, digging up diamonds and gold and silver and making a world for himself, nations for himself, independent nations and institutions for himself in what he told us was hell. Is that right? Heaven is not in the sky. Hell is not under the ground. The planet Earth, is it all right? Everybody stand up for just one minute. Just one minute. You all right? Then none of the seats get stuck, huh? <laughs> Sit back down, brothers and sisters. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, they teach us that the planet Earth you listening? Is 196,940,000 square miles. That is 57,255,000 square miles of land coming up out of 139,685,000 square miles of water on a planet that weighs six sextillion tons, that spins and moves and rotates on its own axis every 23 hours, 56 minutes and 46 seconds at the terrific speed of 1,037 and a third miles per hour as it makes its way around the sun every 365 and a quarter days. But this planet Earth that's spinning and making a complete revolution every almost 24 hours, but really 23 hours, 56 minutes and 46 seconds, it's moving, spinning, rotating. You might get down on your knees at 12 noon and look up to what you think is heaven, all right? But by 12 midnight and beyond there, that earth has now done what? Has it rotated? So what was heaven is now what? And what was hell is what? 
So can heaven and hell be up and down? That means it changes as the earth changes, right? You say hell is in the earth. Come on. If hell were in the earth, hell. If we went in there, don't we come out on the other side? The planet Earth is approximately 8,000 miles in diameter. Half of 8,000 is what? Even at Boys and Girls High School, is what? Is what? 4,000. So that means the center of the Earth is how far away? Just what? Just 4,000 miles away. How could a devil exist 4,000 miles away? The sun is 2,679,785 miles in circumference, some say. 853,000 miles in diameter, burns at the terrific temperature of 14,072 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I agree, that's hot as hell. But how could it exist seven to ten times hotter than the sun, and the sun is 93 million miles away, and you know how hot it gets, 93 million miles away, how could a hell exist seven to ten times hotter than 14,072 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's just 4,000 miles away. It would burn the whole earth up, right? Heaven and hell are not up and down. Heaven and hell are not in the sky and under the ground. Your heaven and your hell is right here on this earth. And so the preacher prays the prayer, our Father, our Father. Our Father, ho, 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 who art in heaven. He goes on to say, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come where? In the sky? Thy kingdom come where? Where? On earth. Is that right? And heaven is in the hereafter. And we are to go to what is called the promise, what? Sky, right? Promise sky, right? Promise what? The promise land in the... I'm going to leave that Greek stuff alone. You don't know what step that was. All of the Greeks do that one. Because I'm really for the brotherhood of the black man and the sisterhood of the black woman. Here's Imam Obaba of the African Islamic Mission. Give him a black hand. Stand, brother. Give him a black hand. This is our brother. This is our family. I'm a member of the African Islamic Mission. Can't you tell? I don't have my booba on today, but I got on the red, the black, and the green and got my national in the pocket and my uncle on this hand and the star and crescent on this one. I'm dressed to kill. <laughs> this is a part of my war drove. My what? This is part of my wardrobe. I'll tell you about the camouflage uniform, why the Muslims sometimes wear the suit, the tie, the bow tie, the white shirt. You think we're trying to be white boys, but we wear, this is part of our what? Our war drove. Separate war from drove, and you'll get the drift. We'll talk about it a little more later. We got other things in our war drove. So we know that when you're an urban gorilla fighting for the minds and hearts of your people, that you got to move in a certain way that so that when you move through the city, it looks like you're blending in with Wall Street. You're blending, blending in with the crackers who are actually oppressing your people. You're wearing the uniform of the enemy. It's a wise strategician. It's a wise soldier who understands logistics and tactics enough to put on the enemy's uniform and then sneak and move in behind enemy lines. I take my bow tie off, take my rings off, take my national off, put my string tie on, and walk in with my bomb in my briefcase. And I look like good fellow Willie Nickens. Look like who? Good fellow Willie Nickens. I put on my Colgate smile, and I walk right in 
They say, there comes one of our boys there. I say, good morning, sir. Morning, sir. Morning, morning, ma'am. They say, how you doing, Willie? I catch the elevator with him. My bomb is ticking. Tick, 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 tick. And I'm cold gating all the way to the penthouse. Morning, morning. They said, that's a good nigga there. That's one of the best niggas we have. I leave my briefcase in the boardroom. Allegory, but it's a good story. <laughs> Catch the elevator back down, leave the building, have a nice day. Well, far out day, guys. Great. Golly gee, wow. I'm out of here. And I get out. But now if I come with my booba on, I wear my booba at another time. My grand booba at another time. Well, I bought it at another time. But when I want to put on another piece of my uniform from my wardrobe, depending on what has to be done, you got to know how to move. If you're going to move into the economic circles of the white man, if you're going to go in behind the enemy educational line, if you're going to go in and infiltrate diplomatic channels, whatever, you got to know how to dress. If you're in the jungle, you must wear, take off your civvies and put on a uniform that looks like the foliage of the jungle so that when you move through the jungle, it looks like the trees, the breeze is blowing the leaves in the trees. When you move, it looks like the jungle is moving, but it's really you moving all the time. you in the desert, you take off your civvies, you take off your jungle camouflage uniform, and you put on your desert uniform. And your desert uniform looks like the sand. It's the color of the sand. You make the tanks look like the sand, and you move through the jungle and it just looks like the desert. But you move it all the time on your enemy. So when you're an urban gorilla, and that's what we are, that's what I am. I'm a Muslim, number one, who is striving to submit my will entirely to do the will of God. But I'm also a Baptist, because I've been baptized. Oh, not in no polluted water of Brooklyn unsanitation or Harlem unsanitation, but I'm talking about in the water of wisdom and the water of the supreme wisdom of the Word of God. I've been emerged and immersed three times. Why do you go down three times? They say, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the preacher says, ha, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Why three times? Three times the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan says to us, because you're going down so that you can come up and you dig deep in at the root of the supreme water, the supreme wisdom of the word of God. And it touches you three times on the spiritual plane, on the mental plane, and on the physical plane. That's why they say you go down three times. You understand? I'm a Methodist because I'm with the man, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, who has the method that's given to him by his Messiah, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, given to him by God Almighty. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Yes, I am. I bear witness to the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods, and the King of Kings. And I try to make my life a witness of his divine power and grace and providence. I'm a Catholic because Catholic means universal. And the black woman is universal. The black man is universal. From us came all of the people of the planet Earth. Everywhere the white man went, we were already there when the white man got there to meet him and to greet him at the shore, or we had built our monument, or we had left our footprints in the sands of time. Everywhere he went, we were there. He went to Kemet. He calls it Egypt from Agaptos, the name that the Greeks, the freaks, gave it. It means the land of the blacks, but the true name in the Medunetta is what? Kemet. And the white man is the number one anti-Kemite who is practicing anti-Kemitism. 
And as he practices his anti-Kemitism, he has attempted to rob us of a knowledge of ourselves. But you will find every, we built pyramids there, called pyramids in Greek, but in the Medunetta called the Kunti. Called what? We had built the Sphinx, is what the Greeks call it, but the name in the Medunetta is Hamaka. Is what? And some call it Abu el Hau, the father of the world, the father of the globe. With the thick lips, the broad nose, the high cheekbones of the black man and woman until Napoleon. Was it Napoleon? Who lined his cannons up with his 21 gun salute and tried to blow the head of the Sphinx of Hamakas off. They went there and found out we had been there. They went down to Central America. They went to South America. We had built pyramids in Mexico. We had the old Mex heads down there. They said, gee whiz, the niggas have been here too. But really, they didn't call our fathers and mothers niggas in those days. Everywhere they went, we had already been there. We are the original people of the earth. We are the original Chinese. What did I say? Talk black to me. What did I say? We are the original Japanese. What did I say? We are the original Australians, the original Hawaiians. We are the original people of the little continent called Asia. And did you know the white man is not even a native of Europe? We are the original people of that place that is called Europe today. Study the scholars, they'll tell you about the Grimaldis who are black people who were there long before the white man came. And we're finding out, we're finding out that even the Grimaldis had a black mom and a black daddy and a black grandma and a black grandpa. So the white man is not even a native, he's not even original to Europe. You're the first people in Europe. You're the first people in Asia. The first people in Africa. What's called North America, Central America, South America, Australia. You're the first people. You lived up there in the snow-capped peaks of the world. You built your houses out of ice because you got supreme wisdom. You could put a heater in the house and the heater don't even melt the house. Is that bad? Huh? She ain't handle that. Look at it. Look at it. That's why we say Asiatic black man and woman. Because at one time the whole earth was called Asia. We're not focusing on one little continent. We're not that silly. We're trying to follow some Johnny come lately so-called Arabs who are not the true Arabs. You are the true Arab. They are not the true Hebrew. You are the true Hebrew. The prophecies of the Bible are to be fulfilled by you. You are the true Israel, the true Jew, the true Hebrew. The prophecies of the Holy Quran are to be fulfilled by you. They were revealed 1,400 years ago, but they are to be fulfilled through you in this time. Did you hear me? I'm not going to be much longer, but I don't know when I'll be back to Brooklyn. I got to drop something on you, because you, you probably got... Susie waiting. Kathy, you're going to call Kathy at the pay phone. Kathy, he tried to keep me away from you. But I got the fever. I got to see you, honey. She says, don't let them keep you away from me. Those niggers, excuse me, honey. We're the Asiatic black man and woman because it was North Asia, South Asia, East Asia, West Asia. The white man talks about Asia Minor. He talks about what? Well, why in the hell you ain't never asked him about Asia Major? Huh? Is that a logical question? The whole earth was called Asia. So when the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Louis Farrakhan say you are the Asiatic black woman, the Asiatic black man, we're not talking about a little continent. We're talking about the whole globe. That's what the character in Spike Lee, from Spike Lee's movie, Jungle Fever, was talking about when she said a true Asiatic black man. He's talking about that original man. So now are you clear that heaven is not in the sky, that this earth is rotating and it changes positions every 12 hours or so? Huh? 
Heaven and hell can't be up and down. Heaven and hell are states of mind, states of being, states of our condition here on this earth. All right? Air condition not working in here is hot as hell, right? Winter time and the heater not working right in here is what? Cold as hell, right? You ain't got no money, you what? Broke as what? Broke as hell, right? You hungry and ain't got no food, you what? Hungry as hell, right? And if you think this cracker, if you think this cracker is gonna change, you crazy as hell. He's not gonna change. Well, I should be honest. I should tell the truth. Because they have made some change. No, 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 no. It's true. They, they really have. It's true. They've gotten worse. They're worse than they've ever been before. They're worse. The white man's nature will not allow him to change. Oh, Brother Spike, Brother Spike, please sit under the teachings. You don't have to join the nation or the mosque, but sit with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and those that he might designate. You must know this thing from root knowledge, not branch knowledge, Brother Spike. We love you, but you've got to do more in your research, Brother Spike. Stop making movies with good white people and bad white people. It confuses the masses. You drop me down in a pit of snakes, and they're hissing at me and all of us. And I'm supposed to look at them and figure out which one has the poison venom sack and which one doesn't have the poison venom sack. Hell, I'm in a pit of vipers and snakes. I don't have time to pick one out and say, that one looks like a cool one. That one doesn't have the venom sack. A snake is a snake is a snake is a snake. And a cracker is a cracker is a cracker is a cracker. And a devil is a devil is a devil. And a white man is a white man is a white man. And don't leave out the white woman. The brothers say they always say the white man is the devil. They didn't say the white woman is the devil. She's the mother of the devil. She nursed him and nurtured him for nine months. She made sure he would be a strong and a knowledgeable devil. You hear me? Stop trying to make us think it's the system. If we could just correct the system. It's not the white spider. It's the spider web. Oh, fool, don't you know if you tear down that spider web and leave the white spider, that the white spider's gonna weave another web? The problem is with the spider and the spider web, as we said earlier, not with the crack, but with the cracker. Mandela, I got to touch on the ANC, jungle fever in South Africa. Nelson Mandela wants a multi- Isn't that what he wants? One person, one vote. The ANC is kept in the media. PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress. You would assume that only ANC and Gacha Butelezi's in Carter Freedom Movement where we are killing each other from Butelezi's Encarta movement and those who are with ANC are killing each other. Now, don't you know if they were taking them knives and them guns killing some white folks, that the white man would outlaw the guns and the knives? But since we are killing each other, have killed over 16,000 recently. And the half of the story is not being told. I mean, some of the war, some of the fratricide since Mandela has been out, but it's been going on for a long time at the hands of a white hand, the white man's hand, who does the dirt and hides his hand. In other cases, he gives them the knife and the gun to kill each other. How do you think the knives and the guns and the drugs get into the black community? The goddamn white man.
Don't look at me like that. I said the goddamn white man. That's what he is. And I'm not using God's name. Don't come in with that silly stuff. Now you don't take the Lord, have mercy. Don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. I said God. God is the supreme being. Is that right? The creator, the sovereign of the universe. Damn means to convict, sentence, condemn, and doom something to hell and destruction and damnation. Only God can do that. I can't do it. You can't do it. We can't do it. So when I say the God damn white man, I'm saying God has condemned the white man. God has convicted the white man. God has sentenced the white man. God has doomed his world and doomed him to destruction and damnation. The goddamn white man. Who? Who is he? Who brings the dope into the community? Don't be scared to say it. Who brings it? Who puts a gun in one black man's hand and a gun in another black man or woman's hand for us to kill each other? Who? Who's putting the knives in the hands of our South African brothers and sisters so they can chop each other up? Who brought us over here on slave ships? We didn't land in Ellis Island, fool. You're not no immigrant. And you didn't come on the Mayflower with the Pilgrim, fool. You didn't land at Plymouth Rock. You got hit in the head with the damn rock. And who hit you in the head with the rock? Who? Who has damned him? Who's the only one with power to damn the white man? God has damned him. That's why I said on the, fly, on the flyer, no goddamn jungle fever for the black man. It's black by popular demand. Because goddamn jungle fever. Not the movie jungle fever, not the movie jungle fever, but the real fever that is going on among our people. God has damned that. The black family must be strong. Black man with black woman, black woman with black man, the two with our children, building a nation unto God Almighty to his glory and his honor. But it's the goddamn white man. Who gave blankets to the Indians filled with smallpox? Who? Who gave them wagon loads of dirt? stepped in between their sacred and religious rights and put dope in their pipes. That Indian was on that pipe. That's true, the Indian was on that thing. They had the Indian on that pipe because it was a religious thing. And the white man stepped in between and started giving them whatever that was. They were, every time they hit that pipe, they were in serious trouble after that pipe. Who gave them the wagon loads of dope to go in them pipes? Didn't he give them wagon loads of alcohol? Who gave it to them? He gave them rifles so they could kill each other, didn't he? Ammunition, didn't he? I guess the sociologists of that day would call that what? Red on red crime, is that right? He's a goddamn white man. He'll manipulate behind the movie screen. He'll manipulate behind the camera. You put it up there for one reason, but he's working for another reason. Working on the minds of our people. We have to be careful. Sister Winnie Mandela is a mighty black woman. I love that, sister. I love Brother Nelson Mandela. But I see Sister Winnie as a strong sister. She was naive and young when he first went to prison. But this devil has made her hard and strong and wise. She's a wise warrior that's ready for a protracted struggle. Yes, she is. This cracker, the old judge sitting on the bench, the prosecutor was one of the same devils who was a jailer when she was locked up. How could she receive a fair trial? And he had promised her that he would one day get her. Now he's an advocate or a prosecutor. The judge called Sister Winnie in words a bald-faced, unashamed, unabashed liar. The nerve of this cracker to call 
our sister that one day I pray for the day that we can storm the courthouse and snatch that cracker off of the bench and snatch his goddamn eyes out of his head and snatch his tongue out of his damn mouth and call in our sister that. I don't believe in no jungle fever in South Africa. The white man is not doing nothing in South Africa. Our Lord God bless us with our freedom. We are not to give the white man nothing. He didn't give us nothing but hell. He didn't do nothing but kill us, kill our babies, kill our women, kill our children, just kill us. The Sharpville Massacre, Soweto, Izingumwene, Port Shepson, Cape Town, all over, killing us. What do we owe him? I kick your door down, come in your house, rape everybody in your house, take everything you've got, parlay it all, and build an empire for myself. One day you're able to throw down on me and take your house back. Do you owe me anything? Should I have a vote? Should I have a voice? I killed your mother, I killed your father, I raped your wife, I raped your daughter. I misused and abused your children. I took everything you had. What do you owe me? You don't owe me nothing but death. If you're merciful, you give me 24 hours to get out of your house by sundown. And if I'm not out by sundown, I recommend that a Pan-African army be raised up, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, a Pan-African army that Osaji for Kwame Nkrumah envisioned where the roll call is given at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the headquarters of the OAU, or the Organization of African Unity. And Brother Ibrahim Babangada walks to the podium of Ni from Nigeria as the gavel is struck and says, Aloudu billahi mini shaitan nirajim, millahi rahman rahim. He say, I, President Ibrahim Babangada, of the sovereign nation of Nigeria. I pledge my army, my navy, my air force, and my marine corps to the liberation and salvation of our people in Azania or South Africa. I pledge resources to this war. Behind him comes Brother J.J. Rollins of Ghana. And Brother J.J. Rollins steps to the podium and says, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the OAU, I pledge the total army, the total navy, the total air force, the total marine corps of Ghana and the people's militia of Ghana to liberate our family in South Africa. And then Muammar al-Qaddafi of the Libyan Arab Jamahariya comes to the podium and says, Al-Udu Billahi Mini Shaitan Nirajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the OAU, I pledge the total Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, arms in the hands of the people, wealth in the hands of the people, uh, education and knowledge and wisdom in the hands of the people, the total population of the Libyan Arab Jamahariya to the liberation of the people in South Africa. And all over Africa, Brother Museveni in Uganda and all over, even old no good Mobutu in Zaire commits to the struggle. And one day F.W. de Klerk wakes up, looks to the sky, and there's a continental air force from all of the nations of Africa over the skies of South Africa. He looks out of his window to the left, and there's a continental Marine Corps coming in, continental Navy coming in, continental ground, ground troops from all points of Africa coming in that will give our 30 to 40 million brothers and sisters an opportunity to rise up on the inside of Africa, South Africa. What is all of this stuff about prolonging it? Why don't these weak African leaders unite and form a Pan-African military and move on South Africa? <laughs> Tell them that you either move or get moved on. You either stop or drop. They deserve nothing in South Africa, no jungle fever government or parliament, nothing but death. What did I say? Nothing but death. Kill them all if they won't leave. Kill a baby. You say, oh, wait a minute. You were doing all right. You want to kill the babies? God damn it. Kill the little white babies in South Africa. Why would you kill the baby? Why would
would you kill the babies? The babies haven't done anything. Let me get out of this auditorium. He wants to kill the little babies. That's sick. Hell yes, kill the babies. Because God damn it, one day the babies are going to grow up to oppress your babies one day. Kill the babies before they grow up. Kill the women. Why kill the women? Kill the women because it is from their womb that the new generation will rise up to further oppress us. So kill the women too. Kill the men. Kill the blind ones, the crippled ones, the crazy ones, the faggot ones. Kill them in the wheelchair. You say, but that's the handicapped. Why would you kill them? How in the hell do you think they became handicapped? They got in the wheelchair oppressing black people all their life. Kill them in the wheelchair. Kill the blind ones, the crippled ones, the crazy ones. Kill the sissy ones, kill the lesbian ones, kill them all. Kill the old ones. You say, but the old ones are getting ready to die anyway. Why kill the old ones? God damn it, how do you think they got old? They got old killing black people and oppressing black people. Kill the old ones too. God damn it, even go to the graveyard and dig up the goddamn graves and kill them in the grave. Kill them again. Kill them again in the graveyard. Kill them again. Kill them again. Dig them up in the grave. They didn't die hard enough. They didn't die hard enough. So dig them up and kill them again. Some of you are sitting here squirming in your seat. You're just as silly as you can be. We're not going to get out of this condition without some fighting, killing, bleeding, and dying. Not a one of you in here came to birth without bloodshed. Mama had to shed some blood. A revolution had to take place. The feet were at the mouth of the womb, and the head was at the top. So teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad to us and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. But the head had to take a turn, and the feet had to take a turn, and a revolution had to take place inside a mother. And then the head crowned. Water burst, the head crown, blood passed, and we came to birth. Didn't make no difference how big mama was, how strong she was, how independent she was. Freedom is a law of nature, and justice is deeply rooted in the universal order of things. And it is the divine intent of the almighty and all wise God and creator that everything live equally under his creation. They may not be created equal, but they were created equally. That's another subject for another time. Listen to it. All things may not be created equal, but they were created equally. I'll work with that another time. You still with me? But brothers and sisters, we're, we can't be like this. Freedom is a law of nature. When it's nine months, when that nine months roll around, no matter how small, how insignificant, how dependent on the systems of mama's body the baby is, because freedom is a law of nature, that little baby makes big mama, that, in, that dependent baby makes independent mama lie down and give it up. If mama refuses to lie down and give it up, it will destroy mama or destroy itself and mama at the same time. Freedom is a law of nature. Stop just wearing t-shirts and buttons and sweatshirts and the red, the black, and the green and kitchen cloth. Wear it. Wear it all. And wear it with pride. But know what you're wearing. And wear it, but wear it in your heart, too. Don't just make a movie in honor of Brother Yusuf Hawkins. Live your life in a way that will honor Brother Yusuf Hawkins. Live your life in a way that will correct what caused the situation that took him out of here. That's the way you honor Brother Yusuf Hawkins. A real black watch. A real freedom or death. When you say freedom or death, you got to mean it. You can't play with freedom or death. Freedom or death. 
That's powerful stuff. Korean take your sister and beat your sister in a supermarket? And you march in front of the supermarket? The hell you marching for? You don't even bust a grape? You don't even bruise a tomato? You don't even bruise an apple? You don't even get no orange juice on your shoes. You should have done the right thing. You should have gone and talked to that Korean. You should drag that Korean behind out of there and beat the hell out of him. He should have been beat in the middle of the street. He should have been beat. That's what I said. You take the tape to the white folks. I said there's no good damn Korean should have been beat in the damn street. You should have beat him in the streets and stopped him and said, that was a black woman. That was a black woman. Next time a black woman comes in here, you treat her with risk. Back. When we start defending ourselves, our enemy will raise up off of us. But some of you are so punkified, some of you gonna run the minister fire come before I can get out of here good. The other minister, he was telling the people that they should, that they should, uh, that the Korean beat our women, that they should stop the Korean or beat the Korean. Brother minister, I know you ain't teaching nothing like that. I don't know why he stirred the people up. I stirred them up because we have to defend ourselves. And I was teaching from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And what I have studied from the scriptural interpretation that the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan has given to us, what I have studied, I find him to be a wise man. I find him to be a balanced man. I never heard him give any kind of instructions like that. But we are supposed to be intelligent enough as we are being guided to study scripture, we are supposed to be able to see things for what they are. Our nature should dictate to us what to do. I don't have to tell you. Nobody has to tell you. He certainly doesn't have to tell you. Somebody is beating on your woman, and you tell about, no, not we shall overcome, but we shall overrun. That's what it should be. Lift every voice and sing. Yes, lift every voice and sing, but lift every fist and swing too. Just be lifting your voice and singing. Lift your fist and do some swinging. When you start doing this, your enemy will raise up off of you. We got to be organized. You can't be no fool. We got to be organized. You got to have supreme wisdom. God has to be at the core of your... He's right. Leave that man alone. That man is telling the truth. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. Get that man a hand. Leave him alone. Give him a hand. Get this man a black hand. Go ahead, brother. Have a seat, man. Let me finish this lecture. Have a seat. Let me finish this lecture. It's an eye for an eye. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Just let him talk. An eye for an eye because he's going to say something and we're going to learn something in a minute. An eye, from an, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb, and a life for a life. If you kill my dog, if you kill my dog, then you watch out for your cat, your parakeet, and your goldfish. Because I'm going to get you, sucker. Fight fire with fire. Sometimes put a little water on. But we've got to protect our women. You'll notice both families in jungle fever, Polly. The Italian boy, his father was Anthony Quinn, kept a shrine to his woman. I mean, he honored that woman. He had an actual shrine. And when Paulie would get ready to leave the house, he would say, aren't you going to say, 
bye to your mother, and he'd have to walk over to the shrine and say bye to the picture on the wall of Angie's home and her father and her sons and her father's sons, her brothers, always talked about the mother. You can't rise any higher than that woman. We're not going anywhere without this black woman, black man. In fact, I don't want to go nowhere that she ain't going to be. You tell me they got a place where there ain't going to be no black woman, I ain't going there. I don't want to go there at all. You can go there, you can have that. That's the only heaven the black man got right there, is the black woman in her proper spiritual state and state of black consciousness and pride. All right, those were the things that I basically wanted to touch with you tonight, touch on with you tonight. I didn't, you thought I was going to beat up on Brother Spike. It's not to beat up on Brother Spike. Brother Spike doesn't need beating up on Brother Spike has done a great service to us. We just have to, have to help him so that he doesn't do an even greater disservice to us. That's all. Show him our love and our warmth and make sure that we keep an eye on our enemy and that our enemy does not step into the middle of this thing and try to kill Brother Spike and lay the murder at the door of the nation of Islam. I thank you, brothers and sisters, for being as kind and as attentive as you've been. Let us all stand. We'll have a question and answer period, but let's close this section. Put your black fist in the air. Raise them high. We're going to do to work on this jungle fever and separating the black man from his woman. We're going to do seven harambe. And harambe means let us all pull together. What does it mean? It means strengthening the black family. It means respect for the black man and the black woman and black children, building our own banks and schools and hospitals and institutions and having a nation of our own, our own flag and our own men and women of great affairs. It means being free, proud, and productive again. Hold him high in the air. This is the way it will be done, just demonstration. We'll do seven harambees. We'll come down, harambe, one time, real strong. We'll go six times and on the, and, and harambe, we go back up. It'll be Harambe until we get to seven. On the seventh one, we hold it. Harambe. Are you ready? Fist in the air. On the count of three. Ja, lee, two. Harambe. 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 You may be seated, brothers and sisters. We'll be out of here in just a second. Just be seated for a second. We'll be out in a second. We can only take one or two questions. We can only take one or two questions. Are there any questions? Any questions? I see one or two hands. Would you come to the mic? I think, would you hold the mic in the aisle there? Go to the mic and ask your question. We can only take a few moments. Brothers and sisters, I'll be, I didn't know it had been arranged, but he's invited to speak at the Slave Theater on August the 14th. When, it's a Wednesday? Wednesday, August 14th at the Slave Theater. The Nation of Islam, followers of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, presents the Knowledge of Self Tour. The black family must unite Roy Wilkins Park. Roy Wilkins Park. 119th Avenue and Merrick Boulevard, Queens, New York, Saturday, July 13th. When is it? 12 noon, special guest, Professor Griff and the Last Asiatic Disciples. And it goes on to list uh, many others. Keynote speaker, Minister Conrad Muhammad, Muhammad's Mosque, number seven, New York City. Minister Conrad Muhammad, Muhammad's Mosque, number seven, New York City, Saturday, July 13th, 12 noon, Roy Wilkins Park, 119th, and Merrick Boulevard. Question. Yes, sir. 
try to make it a short one, beloved. Do we have time for questions, brothers and sisters? You got time for the answers, too? Could you speak up just a little bit? Essentially, give brother a black hand. <laughs> Essentially, brother's question very quickly deals with Genesis, the 15th chapter, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th verses, where it says, And God said unto Abram, Know of a surety, Abram, that thy seed shall be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They shall serve them, and they shall oppress them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. Brother pointed out, that as we add up the years of the prophecy, of course, the 6,000 year period was, in, was in, in, ended in 1914, but the 400 years uh, ended in 1955. And what he is pointing out here is that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan came to the nation of Islam in the year 1955. He says, what does this have to do with that scripture and that prophecy? And ultimately, what does that have to do with the rise of the black nation? Your question is right on time. And let's hope the answer can be right on time, too. Be it the will of Allah. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's coming in 1955 actually represents the birth of one that fulfills prophecy and scripture under the teachings of the Honorable, Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and under the power and guidance of Almighty God Allah that would be raised up as the liberator for our people who would be an extension and the fulfiller of the work of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It is actually the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan by Allah and his Messiah's permission who will be the turning point and the pivotal point in the demise of the white world, in the demise of the white world and the rise of the black world. So his coming into the nation that very same year, my brother, means that he is a man who was born for that purpose and he was seen thousands of years, maybe even trillions of years before anyone actually knew who manifestly this one would be, nor realize who this one would be once crystallized and materialized and standing before us. So his birth, physical birth, May 11th, 1933, I think. Is that right? And his spiritual birth of 1955, I believe it was in February, primarily on the Savior's Day, represents a key turning point in the liberation and salvation of our people and can be found in both Bible and Holy Quran in prophecy and in scripture. The devil. Mr. Bush is a devil and he can only do devilish men. But he's a supremely wise devil. He put 
a boot-licking lackey and a tom in the position. He put a Negro in the position who Tuesday's New York Times, New York Times, the Tuesday New York Times, July 2nd, conservative black judge Clarence Thomas is named to Marshall's court seat. Shows him with his white wife. Judge Clarence Thomas got jungle fever. Shows his black son that he had for his black wife. He left his black wife, he's not an architect, but he left his black wife and got him a fat, ugly wife, white wife. He adopted the ways of the white man. He votes on the issues like Bush would vote. He votes on the issues opposite the way Thurgood Marshall would vote. So they gave us a black man so that they figured it would handicap us if we will go for it, so that we can't criticize him. He would say just what brother said, I gave you one of your own, but he gave us one of our own who's an Oreo cookie. He's black on the outside, but he's white on the inside. And he's got jungle fever on top of that. I wouldn't worry much about the Supreme Court, but you'll notice the Supreme Court is now tightening the laws. Search and seizure, and taking certain rights away from the people, primarily black people, Puerto Rican, Chicano, and others of color. Do you know why? Because the white man realizes that his time is up. He expects an uprising anytime. And so he is empowering his court and his policemen with what they need to put down the rebellion and put down the uprising. And Thomas, what's his name? Clarence Thomas will help them do that. He's another Colin Powell. Colin Powell led the troops into Panama and killed over 7,000 of the black and mestizo Panamanian people. Are there any other questions? Would you move to the mic, my brother? Yes, sir. Hotel, sir. Yes, sir. is our throne. We rule the world from our throne in Africa. But our home, again, is 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth. As I said earlier, everywhere the white man went, we were already there to meet him and to greet him at the shore. So the Earth is our home, and 76 quintillion miles throughout the distance of the diameter of the sphere of light of the universe is our home. That's why this is our flag the sun, moon, and star. It never flies at half mast. This is a symbol of our flag that flies over our domain, which is the earth, all of the planets, and the universe, because you are the original man and woman, the father and mother of science, law, music, government, civilization, mathematics, everything comes from you, and all of the people come from you. Now, let's get back to this. Africa is the throne that we rule from. If you take a flat map, and a map that shows the anatomy of the body, you will see on that flat map that the heart, the human heart, is set into the body in almost the same place that Africa is on the map. Africa is the heartland. That's where we pump life and civilization to the rest of the world. But our home is the whole thing. But our throne is Africa. Now what about Spike calling us African-Americans in do the right thing or in jungle fever. 
We're not African Americans. Where did you get this from? Anytime somebody come up with something, you jump right on the bandwagon. They were calling you minority just a few days ago. And you were fixing your big, thick African lips, pretty African lips, all to the side, talking about you were, you were a minority. We're studying the minority problems and minorities. You're not no minority, fool. You outnumbered a white man 12 to 1. He's the minority. You are the majority on the face of the planet Earth. Now they got you talking about African American. But you wear Malcolm sweatshirts. You wear Malcolm t-shirts. You wear Malcolm buttons. You got Malcolm picture on your wall. You say Malcolm, you wear the cap with X on it. Malcolm said, no, I'm not an American. Is that what he said? He said, I'm one of the 22 million victims of Americanism. He said, I'm no flag waver. I'm no flag saluter. He said, I have not experienced any democracy, nothing but disguised hypocrisy. He says, no American dream, nothing but an American what? Well, how are you going to claim Malcolm and Malcolm was not an American? And Malcolm was with his teacher for 10 years. He was only away from his teacher for 200 plus days. It was the Malcolm of 10 years that you fell in love with, not the Malcolm of 200 plus days. You're not an American. Amerigo's Vespucci was a cracker from Italy. Another half original man, Columbus, trying to get to India, got lost and ended up over here. So he just called the people here Indians. Now they got a holiday for Columbus. Hell, I'm on my way from Harlem to Brooklyn and get lost. You gonna give me a holiday? You get lost all the time. How you get a holiday getting lost? Head in one place and end up somewhere else. So you just gonna make it be where you left for. So these people are gonna be Indians from now on, and I've discovered them and everything here. Isn't that silly? So we're not Americans. You never have been an American. You never will be an American, and you are not an American. You are the original Asiatic black man and woman, and we can use Africa for a period of time, but who was Leo Africanus? Who was Serpigo Africanus? Who was Africanus? Let's be careful that we don't drop one white name and pick up two white names. But we cannot criticize for calling ourselves African because when the baby begins to take a step, we must give credit to the baby that we are not calling ourselves Negroes and colored and jigaboos and all of those other names anymore. The fact that we are saying African, that is a step in the positive direction. But as it is written, we are not what we were yesterday. We won't be tomorrow what we are today. We think we're where we're going, but we're just on our way. Some say it's called Africa. Some say Dr. Ben said it was al Kibulan. Some say it was called Ethiopia. Some say we are more. Some say that nationality is the order of the day. All of that is true. And all of those names are true. Because at different stages of our growth and development, we wore those names just like the baby, the infant, the adolescent, the son, the young adult. The adult. These are stages. All of those are names for us at a different point of our development. We can't deny any of those names because all of those names are us and then some but you are really black. You say, but everybody's named after some land. We can't be named after black if everybody's named after land. You can't follow white folks. White folks ain't got nothing but land that they took, so they named themselves after the land that they took. You're not the people to line up with the people with these little rags and flags. You are the original people of the planet Earth. Your flag is the universe. Brother, would you stand up and show them their flag, please? That red represents the sun. The crescent represents the moon. The star represents itself as a witness bearer to the glory of God, the creator. It represents freedom, justice, and equality, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, the crown of God's creation, love, peace, and happiness, money, good homes, and friendship in all walks of life, a nation of our own and a home of our, that we can call our own. That's, this is your flag. You were black before there was ever a place called Africa, weren't you? You were black before there was ever a place called America. 
In fact, you were black before you were ever male. You were black before you were a female. You were even black before you were even born. Weren't you black before you were born? You were black before you were anything. And black is not a color. Black is the essence from which all colors come. <laughs> Dr. Karenga gives a working definition as he has studied under the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that black is color, culture, consciousness, and I have added with his permission a corresponding cosmic connection. Black is color, culture, consciousness, and a corresponding cosmic connection. How you hook up with the God. That's what black is. Color, what is it? Culture, consciousness, and a corresponding cosmic connection. You were black before you were all of that. So don't line up with these little people. There's Johnny Come Lately, the white man, just got here the other day. That's his thing. That's baby stuff. You're the original from the very beginning, made in his image and after his likeness. You're not an American. Stop calling yourself an American. I was born in America. The oven cools off and the cat crawls up in the oven and has kittens in the oven. Are they cornbread muffins? Are they biscuits just because they're born in the cool oven? You're not an American just because you were born here. That's a joke. Give me your tires, your whatever, your huddled masses, yearning to be free. I told you that Statue of Liberty is nothing but a whore in the harbor. Raising that dress up and letting all the ships come in. We need to take that torch and pull that thing up and see what's really under there. Yes, ma'am. The male organ is the reproductive or the regenerative organ of life. The seed of life or the sperm of life can be ever so pure that comes from the organ of life. But if the organ is the diseased organ, then as life passes through the diseased organ, it can transmit death and even uh, disease into the pure semen or atom of life that passes from that organ and can do more detriment than benefit. If he is the organ of spiritual life in the church, and if the word he preaches is a pure word, and I doubt that if he's a cracker, but he's a vessel that the word is coming through and from is a diseased devil and vessel then he actually diseases and he actually pollutes the word that comes from him. I can't understand them ignoring this devil raping our babies like this and saying they just want him back. That shows you how crazy we really are. We're just crazy as we can be. These cracker policemen that shot over 60 rounds into the van in Newark and some others with them and killed our young 16, 17-year-old uh, uh, sister. And a young brother killed him, wounded a 13-year-old sister and another 17-year-old brother. The rape of our sister from St. John's University. And now they don't want to do nothing about it. The rape of Sister Tawana Brawley. And they've done so much mess with that until many of you don't even believe it anymore. But when this cracker was uh, brought to court in front of the camera, uh, in front of the courtroom from Central Park, 
who said that she couldn't even remember nothing, couldn't identify nobody, couldn't even remember nothing. And they still convicted Brother Yusuf Hawkins and the other brothers. That is to say that only a white woman can be raped, but a nigger woman, as they would say, cannot be raped, is not even worthy of getting justice from the white man's court. We should never expect it from his court. The preacher, the Bible says that the first baptism would be a baptism of water, but that the second baptism would be a baptism of fire. The preacher should be baptized. The white preacher that raped our babies should be baptized in the baptism of fire. Let the church say amen. Yeah. Church say amen again. Yeah. Church say amen one more time. Yeah. So um, some good God-fearing brother, some uh, good God-fearing sister will probably baptize one day the white pastor that raped our baby but he should be baptized. That kind of crime is worthy of death. You rape our little girls and, and, and sodomize our little boys, you deserve to be killed. There's no forgiving you. You deserve nothing but the baptism of fire and death. I don't care if he's a preacher, a teacher, whatever he is. And until you wake up, black man, this is gonna continue. We should be together. We should be organized. We should have an army of our own. We should be under one command. And we should be under one leader, teacher, and guide that God has his hands on, that he has anointed and appointed for this hour. And that man is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, he is. You can make every excuse you want to, but our people are being killed, our babies are being misused, abused, our women raped, everything. And we are standing idly by. We've got to stand up. The white man uses his, with the, as Dr. Wilson points out in the Crest Theory and the Keys, uh, uh, the Crest Theory and the Isis Papers, Keys of the Color, that he uses his nightstick. Uh, well, I've actually added that part. She talks about his gun that he calls what? The equalizer, right? He fears the genetic potency of the black man. That's why he would always cut the black man's organ off whenever he would lynch us. That's why Freud and others talked about penis envy, not just dealing with that kind of low thing. He's dealing with a higher thought about the genetic uh, power of the black man. And the white man knows that he came in through a process of sex birth control and genetic engineering. Read it on page 103 of the great and illuminating book of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Message to the Black Man in America. Page 103, The Making of the Devil. How the white man got here. He knows that genetic annihilation is quite possible, and he has a constant fear of being taken out of here. I was mentioning earlier, and I put that on hold, and I'll finish it now. Watch his symbols. It has something to do with his psyche. His gun is shaped like the erect male organ. Is that right? If the male turns sideways with the erect organ, and you turn the gun sideways, the barrel of the gun represents the erect male, black male organ. It's a dark weapon, brown, black, or whatever. The handle and the trigger represents the scrotum sac, or the regenerative area where the uh, atom of life is produced. This is not vulgar, it's scientific from some of our top scientists, scholars, psychologists, and psychiatrists. Studying the psyche of the white man, the games that he plays, and the symbols that he uses. The gun spews out bullets like sperm, and he uses the gun to, as his equalizer to kill the black man. Is that right? Because he fears the black man and has feared him all his life, as you heard Sister Drew, the character in Jungle Fever, say. All right? We produce melanin to the highest degree that puts us in tune with the sun and the universe and the cosmos. White people reject sunlight, and it is an enemy to them. They get all kinds of cases of melanoma. 
Only time we get melanoma is a rare kind called acromelanoma. And acromelanoma, we only get that in the palm of our hand and maybe under the sole of our feet, and it's gone after a while. But the sun just attacks them and eats them up. Enemy to the sun. So he uses the gun as an equalizer. What is his number one detective called in the movies? What's he called? What's he called? Dick Tracy. Peter Gunn. You hear what I'm saying? Really, do you hear what he's saying? His nightstick that he swings and beats the black man with, shaped like the elongated black or brown regenerative or reproductive organ of the black male the handle on it, and the position that the scrotum sac, uh, the testes would be in. He stretch it out and it resembles the erect black male's organ. So he beats the black man and beats the blood out of him and beats him like you saw him beating Brother Rodney King in Los Angeles. He's beating him with what he considers the black man's re regenerative power and genetic power and his dominance understanding his inferiorization, his recessiveness, and his weakness as a white man. So he shoots him 39 times, 25 times, 42 times, several of them shoot him and shoot him with his equalizer shaped like the organ of the black man and beats him with his stick or his club shaped like the organ of the black man. You with me? Basketball. A big black ball or a big brown ball. What's the object of the game? Keep that big ball from getting down to the other end of the court because down there is a big hole with some blonde nets hanging from it, representing the blonde hair in the pubic area or the private area of the white female. Keep that big black ball or that big brown ball from getting down there in that hole with them blonde nets hanging from it. Michael Jordan stops dribbling at half court, takes to the friendly sky, sticks that tongue out. It starts flying. By the time he gets to the top of the key and uh, the free throw line, he's making a 360 de uh, 60 degree geometric turn. Slam dunks backwards, kicks that leg out, closes one of them eyes and sticks that tongue out. And slam dunks under, around and over and just jams it and crams it and slams it into the hole with the white blonde net hanging from it. White man cringes, oh, NBA action is fantastic, he said. Football, Dr. Welsing said, a big brown elongated ball or a big black elongated ball. What's the object of the game? Keep it from getting down to the other end of that field because down at the other end of that field are some open goal posts with some white pads wrapped around them representing the open legs of the white woman the white pads, you keep that big elongated brown or black ball from getting down to the other end of the field between them open legs with the white pads around. Huh? Black man catch it in the end zone, run 110 yards with 11 men on his back and get down there and run between them open leg. I mean the open goal post, dance between the goal posts and do the icky shuffle in the end zone and then walk up to the camera and say, hi ma. Look at the white man's games. Baseball is a little scrawny white ball. Not a big brown ball or black ball, but a little scrawny white ball. A man stands swinging a stick between his legs. What does he do? He tries to knock that white ball out of sight because he hates himself that much. The white man's feeling of inferiorization. What about golf? An even smaller scrawny little white ball. A man stands swinging a stick between his legs. This is what the scientists are telling us. What does he do with this little scrawny white ball? Trying to knock it into a hole in black mother earth. In the waiting room, his wife is having a baby. The cracker's pacing back and forth. In the waiting room of the maternity ward. What is he passing out? Not little scrawny white skinny cigarettes. That's what he thinks of himself. He's passing out big, long, black, brown cigars because that's a symbol of birth. 
and he gives out cigars, which reminds him of the power and the potency of the God who brought him into the world, the black man. It's true. It's true. His long black limousine, his judges wear black robes on the Supreme Court bench and the other lower courts. White woman for Valentine's wants choc Valentine's Day wants chocolate candy, preferably with nuts in it. These crackers have this all in their minds. We should deal with the, with the good reverend doctor, white preacher, over at that church. Until we start dealing with these crackers, it will continue. We should go and take his butt right out of the church. Ain't nobody else gonna take him out of there. But we're so weak and so silly. One day we will be strong enough to do that all of these things that I'm saying to you, when we are a nation of our own, are coming into nationhood. And we better not wait too long before we come to that. Are there any other questions? My brother here. Brother, we're going to make this the last two. Self, we must establish love and honor and trust and respect among ourselves. We can't disrespect each other. We can't undermine each other. We can't undercut each other. We can't backbite each other. We can't try to outposition and outmaneuver each other. We must appreciate the value and the God-given gifts and talent that each of us uh, can bring to this liberation struggle to free our people. We must ferret out envy and jealousy and enmity and rancor and hostility and bitterness and nigger mess. We practice more nigger mess than we do that which is necessary to liberate our people. I mean, we sit around like we're infantile in our total development with foolishness when a whole nation is going to hell. So, brother, we must do all of those things in terms of nation building and gaining nation building skills and establishing a nation unto God for ourselves. But we have to have, again, love and honor and respect and unity and a knowledge of self among us. The scripture says when a people are in this condition, how can they get out of this condition unless they receive a teacher? And how can they receive a teacher unless he is sent? And the old African adage or proverb says, when the student is ready, the master will appear. And I'm here to say that the master is here. And I think tonight he's in Chicago, but we are looking forward, we were talking about it in San Francisco last week. We are looking forward to getting him here to New York sometime in the very near future. That man is the Honorable Minister Mills Farrakhan. I don't mean any disrespect, but we have to have a leader. We have to have a head. Don't tell me this foolishness about we are equal and we don't need no leader. That's against nature. The body has a head. The parts of the body are equal, but it still has a head. And all of the members of the body protect the head, carry the head around on the shoulders. If you start punching at the head, the hand goes up. If the head ain't mighty enough to go up, the feet get to work it. <laughs> to get the head out of the way of harm, or out of harm's way. The brain starts thinking to protect the head. Everything works for the head. We must have a head. 
We cannot just praise the great leaders who have come before. We must honor the leader of the hour that is here today. No dead general, you listening to me? No dead general can lead a living army. No dead general can lead a living army. I don't care how good the general is. You need a living general to lead a living army. The Malcolm was one of the greatest that ever did it. But the white man killed him. And now Malcolm cannot lead the revolution. We can draw lessons from his mistakes and lessons from his greatness. But no dead general can lead a living army. The, uh, the general must be living to lead a living army. My brother. I want to know why that um, young What's your name, sir? Sir? Say two. two. Give this black man a hand. Brother, say two. Brother, say two. You look like you're going to be a great black man one day when you grow up for our people. And you are in our prayers and our thoughts. And we pray that Almighty God will protect you and guide you. And that the spirit of the ancestors will be with you. The black man would only leave his black wife and go get a white woman, brother, chasing, as you said, after a white woman, if he's a dead black man, dead in the head, confused, brainwashed, robbed of a knowledge of himself, out of his mind, other than himself, not true to his nature. That's the only way he would go after a white woman and leave his beautiful black queen and goddess alone at home. So, brother, in the movie, Brother Flipper, now you got to separate Flipper Purify from Wesley Snipes. That's two different people. You got to separate much of Spike's characters from Spike. But in some cases, Spike is the mind. Most cases, he's the mind behind everything. We feel that he does a great job in many ways, but we feel that we've got to, as we said earlier, walk with him and work with him in some other ways to uh, sharpen things and tighten things. So, brother, he's just brainwashed. We got to work with that black man and get him up. But I don't believe you'll be one like that. You think you're going to have a little white girlfriend? <laughs> Let me say no. Thank you, sir. Give him a hand. The character Nilda in the movie, again, Phyllis Siobhan Stigney, she makes, has these lines where she said, I don't know a man that if the P is staring him in the face, that he's not going to F the P. You know what I'm talking about, expletive deleted. Uh, that the uh, brother don't, just don't know how to turn it down. Look, I'm here to tell you, as the little brother said, doesn't make any difference. There are black men who are principled enough, strong enough, dedicated enough, with God at the root and their core enough, in line with God's will and his way and his law enough, you could bring all the white women in the world in front of them. They could strip buck naked. We would set them crackers on fire. I'm talking about with matches and fire and gasoline. Don't bring me no white woman. That's not me. How many black men in here would turn a white woman down? Stand up if you turn her down. Don't lie. If you ain't sure, don't stand up. If you ain't sure, don't stand up. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Sister, you shouldn't ride home with him if he ain't standing up. Don't even ride, don't even catch the number two train with him. Three, one, none of them. A, B, D, C, none of them. Have a seat. There are some good black men principal black men. We don't want the white man's dog. Don't get me wrong. The white woman is all right for the white man. White man is all right for the white woman. But we need the black family strong. 
We'd turn it down all day and all night and set her on fire with gasoline and matches. Yes, sir. What's the sir? Yes, sir. It's an age-old question. <laughs> Master Farah Muhammad's relationship to what is called the 24 scientists, called in the book of Revelation the 24 elders. Master Farah Muhammad stands independent of and outside of the 24 scientists or the 24 elders. For those who don't understand it, this is just brother's specific question. Uh, the scriptures said that they saw him that sat on, Revelation said that they saw him that sat on the throne sitting on the throne with a book in his hand. And that before him was the lamb, the four beasts, and the 24 elders. So now there's one sitting on the throne, and in front of him is the lamb, the four beasts, and the 24 elders. And the question was asked, who is worthy to go up to he that is sitting on the throne and take the book from his hand? Master Farad Muhammad stands independent of the 24 scientists or the 24 elders and outside of the sphere of the circle of the 24 scientists or 24 elders. I'm almost certain on that. And if by chance uh, I am anyway incorrect, I will, when I am back, be at the will of Allah at the slave on August 14th, uh, after I've conferred with the leader, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I will speak further on it at the slave. But I'm pretty sure uh, that that is correct. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good to see you, sister. Thank you. Dr. Muhammad, we all know that the curriculum that is now being taught to our children in the public school system is inadequate and it is a total lie. Um, there are those that are fighting to get a new curriculum written. I was wondering if you personally or the nation would be willing to get involved in this subject with the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Uh, I know in San Francisco even, he met with a group of leaders, a big group of leaders there, and he spoke of something quite similar in terms of it setting up our own alternative schools and also making the schools that exist, redoing them, taking them over, he said, rewriting the curriculum. He spoke of these things in San Francisco, so I'm so sure that, that when he speaks, it applies for all across the country and the world. Yes, ma'am. Again, it's good to see you. Give uh, Attorney Maddox and the uh, brothers and sisters over at the Slave our love and the greeting. Brother Roy and sister of uh, Maddox, love it. I remember you from Columbia University. Was it Columbia? Uh, from last night, but even before then. Sister's question is my views on the Rastafarian movement and their acceptance and belief of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie as being the conquering lion of Judah. That's a good question. Let's hope that the answer is just as good. By Allah's grace. I'm also a Rastafarian. And I just I just don't have me locks. <laughs> me locks are internalized. But we follow the teachings of a man called Eli Jah. What's his name? Elijah. And when you separate Eli and Jah and understand what Jah really means, then we come together when we go down to root knowledge, we come together at root knowledge. 
It's only when you're hung out here on this branch knowledge that we think because the label is different, there's a big, big difference. Now, Emperor Haile Selassie, and I was just recently blessed to hear his voice. I never thought I would hear his voice, nor would I, did I think I would hear the voice of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, but I found a tape, a cassette tape that was made from Emperor Haile Selassie speaking at the United Nations in Amharic, and it was being translated by a translator into English, and I could hear him speaking in Amharic, and it was quite a treat for me, and to hear the booming voice of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. I mean, he spoke similar to that, and I really, tears came back. I never even dreamed of hearing Mr. Garvey's voice on a tape but it was an RCA record or something that was made, I believe, when he spoke at Mad here at Madison Square Garden. Emperor Haile Selassie, there is so much confusion swirling around Emperor Haile Selassie. Emperor Haile Selassie made some very bold strides in Ethiopia during his reign. He, in some instances, in some measure, gave us a champion. He gave us a hero. He gave us one that we could call our own African or black king. He moved in royalty. He carried himself as a king. And we, the world, the black world, were proud of this king and emperor called Emperor Haile Selassie. Now, there are also other stories swirling around Emperor Haile Selassie that he was abusive, that he was oppressive to the people of Ethiopia, that during his reign, during the latter part of his reign, that it was a very cruel reign, an insensitive reign, and that he to some degree backed up or capitulated to the Italians or to the enemy. To be very frank and honest with you, I have never asked this question of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I am only dealing with my limited research and study and searching on it. But I would like to, with your permission, be able, and all of you, to ask him so that I will not just give you research, I, I of course will share that with you for whatever it is worth, but I, I actually want to know as you what place Emperor Haile Selassie should have in our lives. I do know that if he's the conquering lion of Judah, how come Judah ain't conquered? I mean, if he's the conquering lion of Judah, how come the oppressor is not vanquished? In the book of Genesis, it said the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between her feet, until Shiloh comes, and unto him will be the gathering of the people. It speaks of the scepter, uh, uh, the scepter will, being taken from Judah, will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. We believe that that Shiloh, or that conquering lion of Judah, was in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, who raised up the great Mahdi, who raised up the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, his Messiah and his Christ. I see no sign, my sister, though I love the Rastafarian brothers and sisters, and as I say, to a great degree and in many ways, feel that I'm a Rastafarian. I'm not down with the... I'm not down with the, with the smoking and the getting high. I don't believe that the herb is some religious ritual. And I don't believe the more herb I smoke, I don't deal with it at all. I don't believe that the more herb I smoke, that I'm going to get free. And all the herb you've been smoking, and we were going to get free. Hell, you've been free a long time ago. So I don't know about that. But I really do know about that because our condition bears witness that it can't be mathematically and spiritually correct and accurate. But I don't criticize them uh, strongly for that. That is their belief. Um, I don't see what Emperor Haile Selassie has done nor can do that would qualify him to be the conquering lion of Judah. I don't like the posture of our brothers of the Rastafarian movement because they, many of them have jungle fever. They chase too many white women for me. So I'm a black, like I'm a black Muslim, I'm a black, black Rastafari. No white women and no locks. But if I like locks. If I didn't wear this wardrobe, and if I weren't doing this, I think I'd have some locks. 
I think I either have locks or like I had to do before I came here today, shave it off, shave it every day. I like it either bald, I'd have me some mean locks. Or you see me, I say cool run-ins. <laughs> I love the brothers and sisters, they're very strong. Brother Bob Marley, I thought he was one of the greatest that ever did it. But white women everywhere. History shows that he might have even had white women might have given him babies all over. I, I respect him for being the great brother that he was, but I'm just not into white women like that. I don't understand that. I just can't get ready for that. So I don't see what uh, we could do to focus a spotlight on Emperor Haile Selassie that would take him out of the place in history that he has already earned for himself but I also don't see where we could add anything to him and make him something that he just is not. Yes, sir. Fine, sir. This is our last question, I am sure. Oh, there's a sister behind him, okay. In, in Maryland? Yes, sir, in Baltimore. I haven't uh, been in a while. I was invited some time back. I don't know what happened. I'm invited to Howard at some time in the fall. Hopefully we can set up for Margaret, something for Margaret State during the time that I'm at Howard, be it the will of Allah. Um, uh, there's a brother that works with one of our speakers bureaus that is in the rear, Brother David 3X with Third Eye Third Ear Speakers Bureau. Perhaps you could give him your information and get his and we could work to set up speaking engagements at uh, both Howard and Morgan State during that time. Brothers and sisters, let us stand. We thank you for being as kind and as attentive and patient as you have been. I don't know what happened with the heat here, I mean with the uh, overwhelming heat and why we didn't have any uh, air. You are cordially invited to a gala reception in tribute to the Honorable Louis Fark on Thursday, July 25th. 6.30 to 9.30 p.m., co-host Jim Brown, legendary football Hall of Famer, Sean Connors, songstress extraordinaire at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, 515 Malcolm X Boulevard, uh, $100 per person, semi-formal. It's a fundraiser, brothers and sisters, so you know the white man is not going to finance this. You have heard about our national patron ad drive that we are working to now refurbish the National Center for the Re-Education and Retraining of the Black Man and Woman and Child, and to set up businesses for our people and to purchase farmland. Please contribute to our patron ad drive. Also, when you leave tonight, put something in the bucket. We said that if the brothers and sisters did, uh, I said if the brothers and sisters did not have the money to get in, come anyway. But those of us who have it, let us sponsor those who could not and who could not afford it. But we were definitely not going to turn anyone away here tonight. So drop a 10 in or 20 on your way out if you can, or 100 or 2 or $3 or whatever you can on your way out. But again, the fundraiser uh, tribute to the Honorable Lewis Fark on Thursday, July 25th, 630. Uh, Co-host Jim Brown, legendary football Hall of Famer, and Sean... Uh, Combs, is that right? Oh, that's Jim Combs. I'm, I'm making it um, uh, British. Jim uh, Combs, who um, uh, we know quite well, it's true without a doubt, time is running out, and some of our other very timely songs, who has, Jean, Sister Jean Combs has been in the uh, Nation of Islam, and is a very conscious sister, very soulful, as it says here, songstress extraordinaire. Uh, Gene Kahn, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and you know what it is on, on the X Boulevard. Thank you again, brothers and sisters. Uh, I greet you with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Hotel Tutal Nana. You are dismissed. Please, uh, do they have the bucket set up? Please, uh, brothers and sisters. Yes, sir.
You were a wonderful audience. Let's give yourselves a black hand on your way out. A strong black hand. The Slave Theater, August 14. I'm going to give you this one and this one.